Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so some useful checks. The audio is clear, right? Or is there any noise? No, sir. Okay. Let's wait for two minutes. Hello, sir. Until others join, can I? Uh -huh. I have a concern. Can I tell, sir? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, actually, when I tried doing this, uh, I, I mean, assignment questions, um, questions, there was a free text question also. Like we need to enter um free text but the answers the keywords what we entered were right but i think system is taking like a exact match and it is displaying the marks as uh it is not taking it is not giving marks for that for the free text answers the activity one assignment i'm talking about ah uh, yeah that is that is fine right that is that's okay sir okay no it's not showing the marks that's why it's not uh, taking it that's why i'm asking will it have any impact no no it's non graded right anyway so okay but in graded it will not be that kind right sir ah uh, in graded we won't ask free text questions so okay sir. okay sir thank you thank you sir yeah so let's get started Okay, so see the plan for today is to go over the concepts. Okay, so to go over the concepts and then a very small example will come at the end. And uh, that will be the main theme for today. And let's see what we can, what else we can do. If it gets over fast, then we'll do something, something else. Right. So if not, then there'll be enough time to do only this revision of the concepts. Okay, so that's the basic plan. Okay, so last session, I don't know how many of you at attended. So what we did was a recap of linear algebra, right? Whatever linear linear algebra was is required for weeks one and two, that's what we did. And uh, today we'll be using all, all that we learned in the last session. Okay, so those of you who have already seen the lecture, this may be a repetition, but I hope we'll bring in, try to bring in uh, different perspectives uh, from what you have seen in the lectures. Okay, so it will be more of a reinforcing kind of a session where you go over the concepts one more time before trying your hand at the assignments. Okay, so that's the general idea. What? Excuse me. Is is this session not uh, related to week one? It's week one, yeah. We, this is week one session. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the whole idea of the first week's content is about this representation learning, right? So learning representation. So what I want to do is spend some time motivating this whole idea of learning representation, right? So do, let's start with a very concrete example of taking a documentary film, OK? So let's take a real world example where you are, let's say there's some something that you want to cover and you want to make a documentary. So what you do first is you go around collecting data. So the data in, in a documentary setting is going to be, let's say, interviewing people, right? So you interview 50 people, and you have 10 hours of video footage that you have right so you have 10 hours of footage that has come from interviewing 50 people and so maybe it's some issue right so it's some issue or maybe you're doing a travel documentary and you want to cover a city and all the different aspects of the city right so it could be anything but the idea is 
this is how you collect your data right you have you have your data with you and now what you wish to do is you want to create this documentary and it should be only two hours okay so that's what you have to do right so in the context of week one whatever you have seen so far in week one and from what you have understood of the content how will you go about this So how will you go about creating a document? Any suggestions, any ideas? Uh, yeah, may I? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, I guess the initial step would be to go through the footage and uh, cut out any uh, useless portions. I mean, useless as in which is not essential enough or the documentary would be made without them. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, how? Okay, what? What? I'll take. I'll take it from there. What do you call that process? Is there a technical term for that process? Whatever you mentioned is correct, but uh, is it related to data cleansing, sir? Data cleaning or cleansing? Uh, okay, that's that's true. Data cleaning, cleansing. But I'll take what Vinay has posted in chat. Sir, pre-processing the data. Uh, okay, so. Well, can we say, sir, compression of data? Okay, so that's also correct. All these are correct, but I think uh, one of you have mentioned in the chat, it's editing, right? So yeah, all, all, all that is correct. Compression, cleaning, cleansing, pre-processing, these are all relevant an answers, but I, I'll use the term editing, okay? Because that's what you're doing, right? You're editing and all these are part of the editing process. So, okay, you know what? What all is involved in editing? So one thing was removing what you feel is unnecessary. So what else? Is it only about removing stuff or? Sir, actually we, uh, you know, manipulate, I mean, don't manipulate. We cleanse the data as per our business requirements, sir. Whatever things we required, we just keep those things and which is, is not unnecessary, which is not necessary. Uh, we remove uh, that information from the data. Uh, I think that's a data cleansing, uh, uh, part we say mm, okay that is cleansing right so editing is something more involved than cleansing right so let me put it to this way that that that, that also is correct i agree but editing you know if, if i would call it uh, so maybe editing is not the right term but anyway so i will do the following things so first thing is if you look at it the requirement i need two hours of documentary so i have 120 minutes of content that i have to deliver but I have interviewed 50 people and I have 10 hours of recording, right? So even if I go for three minutes per person, that will be like 150 minutes, right? So it's obviously pointless to look at all the people. So I'll, I'll have to do some kind of selection, right? So I'll have to first maybe choose all those interactions which are interesting. OK, so I'll first choose people. Then what I'll do is I can't, so that may Take me down to five hours. Okay, so editing, cleansing, you could call call it all this, right? But even then, right? Even even with five hours of footage, I, what I have to do is I have to look at key moments, right? Important moments or uh, like really great conversations, and those bits I have to pull them out. And it's I can't just put them all together, right? I can't dump it on the audience. What I'll have to do is I'll have to weave them into a narrative. So I'll have to you know, address a few things first and then some, some other set of issues next. I'll have to do that. So can you mute if you're not, not talking? Yeah, thanks. So I'll, I'll have to weave them into a narrative. And the other thing that I'll have to do is what? Make sure that all sides of an issue are represented. Okay, so if you're doing a travel documentary, let's say, then you can't just show one particular monument or place, right? So you have to show at least five, six important places. So you'll have to bring out different dimensions of the issue, OK? And at the end of the day, what you need is something which captures the essence of the subject you're trying to cover. Okay, So I'll, I'll, I'll do all these things. OK, so choose people, choose key moments, combine these key moments into a nice narrative, a nice story, so that it doesn't seem very disjoint. And of course, you, you cannot be unidimensional. You can't be biased, right? You have to capture all important aspects of the problem. And finally, what you have done is you have hopefully captured the essence of whatever you're trying to cover. 
Okay, so why am I saying all this? All this is important because related to the theme of learning a representation. Okay, so if you look at documentary filmmaking, the process that goes into creating a documentary is actually what? You're doing so many things, right? You're doing all these things. You're actually compressing it. As you pointed out, you have 10 hours of footage, you're bringing it down in, into two hours. But in that compression, what are you achieving? You're achieving some kind of a representation of the issue you are covering. Okay, so there's some representation involved. And you're also reconstructing that whole subject in in front of the audience, right? So you're giving them a, it's not all those 10 hours, right? You're pulling something out of it that is not different from the essence of the data that you have, but that is as close to the data as possible. Okay, so these are the themes of uh, this whole process of representation learning. And this is as true about the data set that you have as it is about, say, documentary filmmaking, right? So you have a bunch of end data points and you want to learn a representation from it. And you can think about this whole process as some kind of editing, right? And that's what this PCA does, right? So we'll, we'll try to understand what PCA is from this kind of an angle, right? So this is all just a motivation for what it means to learn representations. So you can keep this kind of a picture in the background. Okay, so that is the first point. So what is a good representation? What do you think is a good representation to have? One which minimizes. Easy to understand. And... OK. Minimum loss of information. OK, minimum loss of information, right? I'll take that. So if you bring it, if you tie it back to the documentary example, you are trying to cover an issue, right? And the hope is that your documentary is as close to the truth as possible, right? So you'll have to stay as close to the truth as possible. So you'll have to make sure that your reconstruction is close to the original. OK, so this is the average error in your reconstruction or your representation. So you have to clearly minimize this whole thing, right? So you'll have to minimize this thing. And you have to choose your representations in such a way that you minimize your error. OK, so all this is clear. So this is how you define a good representation. Now, can someone tell me what will be the minimum value of this expression here? This sub, this Zero. Sub Oh, sir, okay. no, sorry, sorry. The value will be like the same data set, I think. Xi only. I mean, uh, okay, you are correct. Zero. So yeah. both your answers are correct. So the the value will be zero. And when will it be zero? As when the error is uh yeah. Yeah, error is zero. And zero. when how if when and under what circumstances will the error be zero? When xi r becomes exactly the same as the xi's. That's good, right? So when XIR, the reconstruction or representation, whatever you call it, becomes the same as XI. OK, so the, so what have you done, really? What is missing in your in your recipe? You want to find a good representation. And you said you want to be as close to the original as possible. So I'm telling, OK, then just have your original itself. Why do you care? What are we missing here? Dimensional reduction. Okay, so that's we are getting there, but assume that for now we don't know all that, right? Uh, can you put it in a different way? A number of data points should be uh, much lesser than as compared to the original one. Number of data points. A oh, number of, I mean, the uh, number of data points into uh, the dimensions, features. Basically, the the product should be much lesser than what it was. Okay, okay, that is fine. Uh, but well, like we need uh, less space to store the data, sir. The all the data point, whatever information we require. Okay, I'll take that. So, how do you? What is that called? In an optimization setting, what is that called? Compression, sir. Uh, that's compression. Compression is correct. But what are you imposing on your problem? Constraints. That's correct. Hey, that's good. So, what you're interesting, what you're imposing on your problem is a constraint. Right? And the constraint in this case happens to be a compression. OK, so that's that's very important. And it's a very nice quote. Right? So if you if you want to have freedom and you don't want any kind of discipline, then you will get into problems. Right? So you need some kind of a constraint. And the constraint in our case is going to be compression. OK, so how do you compress it? 
So what is this constraint that you're imposing? I have written something down here. What did, what does this mean? Xi's are as close to Xi, as much possible as Xi. Uh, okay, that is the objective function that you're telling me. Xi is as close to Xi R as possible, that is fine. But what in, in English, in plain English, right, what does this constraint actually tell you? The dimension. Mm, not quite. Uh, maybe uh, like I can represent this x. Uh, the I can represent the representation uh, reconstruction vector in some uh, form, which so basically I only need to store the alpha i's and the w is the w vector is common. So that okay, kind of that is that is correct. Uh, but that is like going one step ahead. So just take a step back and tell me geometrically what am I telling? What am I saying? Is it here? Says like saying a linear uh, some linear value okay that's like, close it's a w is the unit value some scalable value scaling it yeah we are scaling the uh, linear vector w oh, by the formula of loss basis mm, okay i'm getting close answers but i'm not getting the one that is so what am i linear forcing direction linear scaling Scaling, okay, linear scaling, okay. So the that, projection. But projection is fine, but like, even you have to bring alpha i closer to one. Change of basis? Uh, no, no. All these are quite close, but so okay. Tell me this. But this is the formula for loss. No, no. I'm I'm asking this x i r is equal to alpha i w means what in in plain English? What what does it mean? Geometrically, what does it mean? XIR is a scaled version of W. Okay, but what is W? What does W represent? Um, it's the direction of the line. Best fit line. Okay, direction of a line, XI. So what am I saying that all the points should? What should line. they do? Line, line the same, line. same line. Ah, okay. So that's, that's that's projection. That not, not yet projection, right? Yeah, we'll come to projection, but the constraint is saying this, right? This is very important because this is the heart of the PCA, right? So what we are saying is that we are we want all the points, all the reconstructions to lie on the same line. Same line. Okay. Okay. So that's what this means in English, right? In in geometric sense, in English, this is what it means. I am forcing all the points to lie on a single line. Okay. Under this constraint, I am asking this question: What line should I choose? That's that the best of it yeah you get this minimum error as far as the reconstruction is concerned okay so i hope this this part is clear so so we'll now get to this this next section where we i think this you would already know once you have fixed a line which is represented by w then the best representative of that point is going to be this green color fellow right these are all proxies by the way these are all equally good choices, but this is the best choice. Why is that the case? Because those lines are uh, minimum, minimum distance from the point. From the point. So the right? perpendicular so distance is the shortest, and so we'll have the smallest reconstruction error while trying to regain this point. Okay, right. So that's good. So this is clear. So now we have uh, a very important diagram which you have to always remember, which is this. So we have a data point x, and as you all rightly pointed out, this this projection, which is the green color uh, point, that's the x i r, right? That's the representation representation for this particular blue point, and that corresponds to the projection of x onto w. So that is this. The error is going to be x minus x transpose w w. Okay. So, and we are only interested in lines with uh, I mean. We are representing the line using a unit vector, right? So norm w is one, and uh, the reconstruction error is going to be x minus x transpose w w norm of that, and you are squaring that, right? So any questions in this slide? I hope this is clear. Any questions, sir? You have taken this w as a like uh, uh, it, the mode is one, right? So just in case if it is not one, so how to write this equation, sir? 
so we did this in the last session so i request you to go and refer to that right so there are, there is a section on projections where we discussed what the projection looks like if the if w is not unit norm so can you just briefly like uh, if you possible like just a short uh, quickly you can explain here like uh, i think it's very important uh, i have, i'll go through it but if anyone is not going through, uh, has gone through i think you can briefly just uh, uh, so we, it will be very helpful for me to also uh, you know to be in lecture actually i can understand these thing uh okay see it is it's just a division by w like this norm of norm of w square right if norm w is not one so uh this specific thing was discussed so it, it's it's like not very hard right it's just scaled by some quantity that's all happens okay so if w is not unit norm this expression will be scaled by something and it's just a scaling factor uh, may i interrupt please yeah. uh, i could not find the slides of the last session or uh, the link to that so slides are there in the supplementary contents you you should you you'll find a folder called like live sessions and inside that you will find the slides so you will need the mail regarding that yeah yeah so there is one master I folder i don't seem to be able to find that okay i'll just check again yeah. sir i am not able to find the supplementary content uh, thing i i'm not sure if uh, anybody is uh, finding it or not where in the portal uh, uh is it not there it's there right yeah, it's there sir as part of supplementary contents yeah if so you I... just scroll down below there will be supplementary content you have to go down deep down oh, yeah now, now i am getting that for the today yeah, you have to uh, go you... down yes uh, yes for today it wasn't there uh, that's why yeah, today we are able to see yeah okay yeah so i think it's done that so only thing you need to understand is if w is not unit norm this thing will be scaled by something okay so for now just stick to this it's not too hard right it's just sir extra. yeah i just uh, one point here so uh, here uh, you have drawn this line right uh, the uh, the perpendicular line is a projection line so does it always has to be uh, you know the shortest one or like it can be different also i mean uh, you can uh, this point can be anywhere so do we need to consider uh, like i think i saw some questions i mean practice assignment somewhere so uh, so i just want to know uh, like this line right the the error like error vector you can say whatever you can say is it does it has to be always the 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 i uh, mean the uh, ninth i mean what to say i don't have the term it should be it perpendicular is, yeah, it has to be smallest one yeah smallest one yeah, perpendicular one or like it can be different also sir uh, no right it can't be because it has to be perpendicular otherwise you will end up having a longer or a larger error okay sir yeah the the, the if you see that the first uh, the green point okay beside the w okay so if the line is like that so can't we can't we we can't consider this thing as a projection right no projection is always the orthogonal projection orthogonal only the one which is yeah perpendicular okay. to the piece okay okay yeah so we won't be considering uh, any projection which is not the perpendicular one right so that is not that is that won't be the right projection yeah they are all not uh, they are all good proxies i mean they are all proxies for that point x but they are not the best proxy so the best proxy is always the projection and by projection we only mean the orthogonal projection orthogonal projection all right yeah that makes sense sir thank you okay so any other questions on this slide i i hope you are all clear about this error right x minus x transpose w w is the error and the length the squared length uh, length squared right so that is the error uh, i hope that's clear okay so now you what you do is you average this error over all the data points so for one data point it's xi minus xi transpose ww norm square for n data points you just sum up all these values and you divide it by n so visually what does it mean it means you add these distances you add this dotted line this dotted line this dotted line this dotted line. okay square of them you don't just add this distance but you square the distance you add them all and in this case you will divide it by 4 because there are four data points okay so that will give you the average error and you have you have to minimize this okay now 
do you understand what this diagram is telling you is there any confusion about what this diagram is about different w's different best fit line yeah so different w's when you have to choose the best w right so i hope that is clear to all of you okay so this w for for instance is clearly a bad line to choose because the errors are going to be huge right if you drop a perpendicular from here to this line it's going to be huge okay so you'll have to keep looking in the circle you'll have to keep rotating your weight vector in the circle and at exactly two locations you will find that the error is minimized what are these two locations so basically when it shoots off in the first quadrant and when it shoots off in the opposite direction that is the third quadrant exactly right so exactly one quadrant and in, in the anti parallel vector in these two locations you will find that the error goes to the minimum value okay so that is and sorry could you repeat that i didn't get it okay so what you are doing is the, so the circle by the way is a circle of unit radius okay so this yes, is a unit where w would be having norm of 1 right correct then w would be having norm of 1 so one way to think about uh, this minimization problem is you start at some angle theta and then you go one full round okay you, you go all the way from theta to one full round and along the way at each point at each in increment you calculate this error right and at some point this will hit a minimum right let's say it hits a minimum at this particular location it will also hit the same minimum when you come to this anti parallel vector which is 180 degrees opposite to it yes okay do you agree because 180 degrees right right 180 so degrees it's ultimately on the same straight line right yeah it's the same straight line okay so, so 180 degree or 90 degree uh 180 right 90 would mean something like this uh i mean not this but something that's similar uh, the to same this. line but the different like opposite direction okay. yeah okay. okay so that is error minimization so that's what we have to do so here is the objective function uh, that you have one question you said yeah. we keep moving al along that one unit circle by how much i mean How okay, so that's just an image, right? So that's just a visual image that I gave you. It's that's not the way you will do it, right? In reality, so in reality, okay. this this will turn out to be something altogether different. But if you want to understand it uh, in a visual sense, then you can think about it as say moving by one degree. Okay. All right. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please go on. Below below min there is something written as W and then the norm of W. so what how do we read that i mean like it's not very clear it is it norm because yeah yeah so so yeah what what is what this is is actually minimize this expression subject mm -hmm. to norm w equal to 1 so it's actually uh the constraint norm w equal to 1 so uh, yeah I, i get your point so it's uh wait this way i'm actually asking you to minimize w sorry minimize this expression let us call this expression f of w subject to norm w equal to 1 okay this is what we are actually expected to do okay okay and uh, instead of writing this in this form we are writing it as maximize uh, okay it's actually minimize minimize this in matter right so i Yeah. So I'm just this is the uh, shorthand for it. Okay, okay. Sorry, it was not. I mean, the uh, for some reason I'm not able to see the expression very clearly in the slide. Uh, so I saw only one line, and uh, it was looking like a minus. It was not looking as equal to. So yeah, yeah, got it. That was the confusion actually. Yeah. yeah. Sir, our motto is always uh, make W is equal to one. Yeah, you always look for so. you are you are interested only in the direction right because the magnitude is actually immaterial you are interested only in the direction and you, you might as well look at unit norm vectors right rather than worry about what the magnitude of the vectors 
Why W is assigned to one? It is not always one. Is... Direction, right? So the direction is independent of the magnitude. It's not equal to one. We have to make it to one unit vector. That was even in the problems. You have to convert it to unit vector. Right, right. That makes your life easier, right? You, I mean, you can do it without without one also. But what will happen is your expressions will get a bit uh, clumsy. Okay, so dealing with them is a problem. I mean, not a problem from the mathematical standpoint, but there'll be too many symbols. You'll have, you, it'll be confusing. Okay, shall can we move on? Uh, sir. Yeah. Just a small clarification. I think someone said that error should you know our motto is to make error zero, uh, error one, not one. I think the motto is to make it zero minimum, right? Uh, yeah. No, not error. Uh, I think the question was about W. Why is why should W be one? Okay. Okay. So uh, related to error, the objective should be to make it zero, right? Yes. Error. You want to push it to zero. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, or as close to zero as you can. Yeah, 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 got it. Okay, so let's quickly go through this algebra. Uh, I think this is also important. Now, how do you rewrite this expression? I, I've taken the error for a single data point. How do you expand this? Multiply it with same. Multiply with its transpose. Yeah, okay. Multiply it with its transpose because v transpose v is norm v square, right? So you do this. Okay, so what will be the how will this expand out? What will be the first term? Xi transpose, transpose xi. Okay, xi transpose xi. What will be the second term? Let's say you multiply start with this point, xi transpose xi, then Xi transpose into Xi transpose W times W. Xi transpose W square. Okay, right. So Xi transpose W square. That is correct. So you will see that I just written it down here. So Xi transpose Xi is clear. What will happen next is Xi transpose W into Xi transpose W again. Okay, and when you start with this expression here, you will get the same thing. Only thing is that you will have W transpose Xi. But you can always swap that and write it as xi transpose w. And finally, you'll have xi transpose w the whole square into w transpose w. Is this clear to everyone? How we came came up with this? Yes, sir. Okay, so now no, sir. Can you please elaborate on this step, please? Okay, which which part you are xi transpose xi is clear, right? Yes, sir. That that bit is clear. Oh, when you are doing xi transpose with the second one here, okay, xi transpose something into w. Okay, so this becomes xi transpose w into xi transpose w. See, xi transpose w is a scalar. Okay, so it's like saying xi transpose. Okay, so let's we'll very very quickly do this. So, what I'm saying is, second term is xi transpose. Into the bracket you have xi transpose w w right this is what you have right correct sir so this is a scalar okay this is a scalar so I can take it out of and take it out of my computation the computation won't get affected so all that I'm left with this xi transpose w again okay so it becomes xi transpose w square got it sir Okay, so that's what happened. Now, something similar happens if you consider the other terms as well. Only thing is that W transpose Xi is there instead of Xi transpose W. That's just the same, right? So you have Xi transpose W is the same as W transpose Xi. And finally, you have W transpose W, which is 1. Okay, so you end up with this expression. You all agree with this final expression? Yes, sir. Okay, so now this is what you want. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, for one, I really want to thank you. This is something was, which is really upsetting me in 1.4, uh, how we got this. Uh, but uh, I still don't understand when we multiply the second term over here, um, that's uh, xi transpose w uh, into w uh, 
uh, transpose. Why does why does this take only the last W take the transpose? Uh, okay, so you mean this term, right? Yeah, I mean uh, when we multiply yeah, the second term with the uh, x i. Okay, the so the second yeah, term. yeah. Okay, so so because. You're saying you're asking about this state transpose W times W and yes. transpose times right. XI, right? Yeah. Now you're asking why only W gets transposed. Yes. Okay, so this is again a scalar, right? XI transpose W is what is some number? It's like okay. instead of XI transpose W, think about it as 2W. Okay. So this is actually 2W transpose XI. So okay. the two is not only getting... W gets transposed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. This was a really big help. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So what we have done is for one data point. Now we need to just add this across all n data points, right? And divide by n because that's what we started off with. So that's what I've written down here. It's the average error, and uh, the next step will be just Plugging in this xi transpose xi minus xi transpose w whole square here. Yeah, I've just plugged it in into the summation. Now, what do you think will be the next step? After this, uh, we we'll, we isolate the xi transpose xi. Okay, why why do we do that? What what gives us the drive to do that? Uh, because our maximize uh, sorry uh, the okay may I continue oh. objective yeah, is go on, go on. Go on, minimize go on. w yeah exactly so we are we are supposed to minimize so basically our object our optimization problem is concerned with w only so we can uh, isolate x size because they are not dependent on w in any way right that's correct very good so we don't care about the Xi transpose Xi because they don't depend on W. So as far as our, our problem is concerned, Xi is a constant. Okay, in a sense, it's a constant because we are given the data. So it may seem counterintuitive for those of us who are new to the subject because we are so used to X being the dependent variable. Meaning you you saw you are we are used to solving equations with X, right? So two X plus three X three Y equal to four, and then we have to solve for X and Y. But here, what happens is that we are not solving for x. X is given to us, and therefore is, is a constant in some sense. Okay, so we are solving for w's. Okay, so that is that is this journey from min to max is what we'll be doing next. Okay, so I, I'm just repeating the same thing. This is what we had, and we said that we can get rid of x i transpose x i. So what what can we do here? Instead of minimizing, we can maximize it and remove minus i. Okay, very good. So we just throw away the minus and we maximize the expression. It's the same thing. So, okay. So what, why have we used this three, three equal? I mean, not equal to, but this equivalence symbol, right? It's the equivalence symbol. Why is that the case? Uh, because uh, both of the optimization problems are not exactly the same. Because the the solution to both of them would be uh, no, not the solution. I mean, they are both different problems, but they give the same solution. Very good, right? That's very good. So the w value that you will get is the same, but the exact value of the function is going to be different, right? And because you have thrown out this xi transpose xi here, right? So you will not end up with the same value of the function, but in all in all aspects of the problem, in all other aspects, you are essentially solving the same optimization problem, right? So that is correct. So what is the next step? Sir, can Sir, you please elaborate what you just said and what Yash said right now? So, yeah, so what Yash said is that if you have this, right, let's say you, you have this, you solve this problem, and then you solve the problem on the second line. Now, will your W, the, the final optimal value of W that you get, is it going to be different or not is the question. Okay, so uh, let me take up a simpler example where there is W is just one variable. So I'm trying to minimize over W this expression, which is W square uh, minus 2W uh, 
plus one. Right. Let's say that's fine. Okay, I'm trying to minimize this expression. Okay. Now I am claiming that because of the form that W takes. Now W takes this nice form, right? W minus one whole square plus what? Plus four. Plus four, right? So now because this objective function takes this form, I'm claiming that I can also write this as So w square minus 2w plus 1. Do you agree that both this problem and this problem will end up giving the same value of w? Yes. Yes. Okay. The same value of w. However, what is the optimal value of this, this function? w square minus 2w. Uh, I mean, uh, so this is the same as saying what? This is the same as saying w minus 1 whole square, right? So that's what this is. Uh, so no, what? sir. We can also remove the 1, right? It's also a constant. OK, so it's a good point. But uh, OK, tell me what happens then. OK, it's, uh, we have landed in some slightly difficult terrain. But tell me what? how do we go from here? Okay, so then we would apply the uh, like take the derivative and equate it to zero and find the uh, w that minimizes the okay, good. objective function. Okay, what will it be? Two w minus one minus uh, two. Okay, so w equal to one. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, right. So that's good. Right. So let to so what what we have done. I, I'll go with. I will go with that. So let me write it down side by side. Okay, just give me one second. So this is the problem that we started off with. And we are saying that this phi is a constant. Let's just throw it away. But I am not allowed to use equal to symbol, right? Because if you solve this optimization problem, both of them are going to give you the same value of w, which is 1. But what is the value of this function? It is 1 minus 2 plus 5, correct? is not equal to 1 minus 2, right? Even though, in essence, we are actually solving the same problem. OK, is, is this clear, what we have done? Yes, sir. OK, so it is But sir, clear. let's go back to the previous slide. And uh, if we look at the, no, not this one, that's just the previous one. Okay. Here, the, the one in the box and the one at the same level, the first line on the right, aren't they equal? That's true. They are they are the same. So that here here you can do an equal to. You are right. But it's starting from here. You can't do the equal. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. All right. So now, uh, okay. How do we proceed from here? I think you've already seen the video. So, sir, just a small follow up question, sir. Yeah. Like our objective is to minimize error function, right? Yeah. Or the objective function minimize error, right? So yeah. up to min, up to min means up to second line. It is clear. But then all of a sudden, why we are moving to maximizing it? Like, of course, that concept is clear that we took out the negative sign, right? But why right. we are going to maximize it all of a sudden? Uh, that's how it works, right? If you are trying to, so if you are trying to minimize a function, you can as well maximize the negative of the function. Correct? Okay. So it is just a different way of representing it. Exactly, yeah. So. If you if you want to minimize something, you try to make it as maximize of negative of that. Yeah, as possible. Yeah, that's that's the just an algebraic trick, right? That's all. Okay, now how do you proceed from here from this line? What do you do? We just rewrite it in this way. It's just a uh, you are allowed to do this because dot product is symmetric and all this is fine you haven't done anything complex yet now from here what do you do change of uh, places change of brackets yeah 
So you just change the brackets. You just move. Correct, right? You just move the W transpose and the W out of it, and you bring the one by n inside. Okay, you are allowed to do this because for all the n data points, it's the same W, right? So that's all you have done. And now this is nothing but your covariance matrix, provided your data is centered. Okay, so we'll come to why you have to center the data set at the end, but for now, this is what you have come to. Okay, is this equivalence clear to everyone what we started off with and what we have ended up with? Uh, sir, I understood how we can ended up with this, but why is this covariance, the summation of xi, xi transpose? Okay, so that is something we discussed last. Yeah, I understood the covariance matrix, but I don't know how this summation is it the multiplication you had said about the rows and the column vectors being multiplied. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, it's the column row form of mat matrix multiplication, but that's not the only reason. Uh, so just go over that session once. So for now, just think about it as a black box which gives <laughs> you the covariance matrix. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, all right. So this is. Any 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 other questions? Anyone? One question. So, so when we create covariance matrix, at that time, do we uh, need to uh, uh, basically subtract uh, the mean values of? Yes, yes, yeah. So the covariance matrix, by definition, is variance. Okay. Uh, after you do, so you you. Okay, so since you ask this question, think about the variance, right? So yeah, yeah, what okay. is? You do that, right? So the covariance is something similar. So it's actually x minus mu into x minus mu transpose, but mu is zero, right? Because you have centered the data set. So mu is zero. So this will just become x a x a transpose. Okay. Uh, so, so I have it. I have. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have one more question. Um, earlier, when you were mentioning it, uh, just uh, made a reference that x i transpose w is a scalar. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. So why should I actually worry about transposing it before uh, removing out of the square? Like when I put it as xi transpose w whole square, why am I actually uh, putting the transpose here and then doing the multiplication? It's already a scalar, isn't it? Uh, is that is that is true. But what you're doing is you're doing two things, right? You're doing, you're first changing the order of the dot product. Okay. okay, and you're doing it, it, it's a trick, basically, it's an algebraic trick. So you're doing it so that you get this xa, xa transpose side by side. Uh, okay. Okay, so that's the only reason you're doing it. There's no other. So if you had just retained it as sigma 1 by n xa transpose w mm -hmm. square, that mm -hmm. is at this level, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have been able to move on to this, right? So you right. somehow want to push your way through and get to this. Okay. Okay, it's just an it's just algebra, nothing else. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, we haven't subtracted from mean, so but still, how do we say it is centered data set? No, no. So what uh, what I'm saying is, assume that it's centered. Okay. Okay. So uh, so if it is not centered, then you do the centering by subtracting them. That's mean. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If it is not, then you are as you are right. You you can't call it the covariance matrix. We are okay. assuming. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sir, uh, one one question here. So I think yeah. uh, Ravi has already asked. So uh, in the covariance matrix, okay. So we have taken the terms x i and x i transpose. So is it uh, uh, reversible? I mean, we can interchange the uh, these terms, sir. X i transpose then x i like that. Ah, uh, no, right? Because first of all, that would give you a scalar value. X i transpose x i is a scalar value. Uh, this is a vector value, right? So since I think a lot of you are asking about the Covariance matrix. Let me, let me quickly pull up that slide. So that, uh, sir, in fact, in previous session we had discussed that today we'll start from covariance matrix and min max. <laughs> gentle, gentle reminder is <laughs> okay. So let me okay. Let me just go back to that covariance matrix. Yes. Uh, we had discussed this. What is that covariance? Hello. 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 Yeah. Okay. And then, oh, hold on, two slides. 
Um, while you do that, can I just ask, throw the question out so that you can answer me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's been a while since I started covariance, but uh, my uh, intuitive understanding of covariance is like that. Uh, first of all, I'm not exactly sure how this came up, but I can. So my diagonals are just the pivot points which are varied and all the other elements are how it relates to one another. Exactly. Is yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. The pivot points are how the. It's like the I have five parameters. Uh, how each parameter is related to another one. Correct. Correct. Yeah. How they pairwise, how they are related. So uh, my diagonal. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah. my diagonal elements are not Correct. shouldn't be variance because my. It, should, it will be variance. Yeah, it's uh, so diagonal elements are variants and rest of them are not, right? Covariance, correct. They're they're co okay. they're correlations. All right. Yeah, Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, so, Karthik, can I take a? Uh, I wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. So, in the earlier question, xi transpose xi is the dot product. Xi and xi, the reverse is the outer product. Exactly right. And because if you go back to how covariance, covariance is defined, I mean, this is statistics one. It is x minus, so let's say there are two variables, so x minus uh, the mean into y minus the mean of y, whatever, right? It's the same thing which you are extending here, right? Except that we are writing in the x, uh, the, uh, in a vector format. That's all, right? It's the same thing. That's true. That's, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Right. So, uh, yeah, so the covariance matrix, I hope that is what is visible now, right? So the covariance matrix, yes. Please uh, put the recording link in the calendar. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it will be uploaded. It will be uploaded. Anyway, it's being streamed also. So it will also be uploaded. Yeah. See, the, that's the formula, right? But going behind the formula, you have, you have D variables, right? And Let's look at two variables at a time. I'm calling this variable p and variable q, the p -th variable and the q -th variable. And you're looking at how they vary together, right? So for all the end data points, you compute how much they are far away, how far they are away from their respective means, multiply them together and sum them. Okay, so if this expression is not clear, the expression for the variance for a single variable, we'll kind of clarify that. For a single variable, what is it? It is how far that each data point is away from the mean corresponding to that variable, and you are squaring this. This is the variance, right? For covariance, instead of just one variable, you have to consider two variables. OK, so this is the covariance matrix. And if you look at it for a concrete example of a 3 by 3 case, say you have three variables, then the diagonal elements will give you the variance because they are CPP of the form CPP, right? C11, C22, C33. And your off diagonal elements will be the covariance or how two variables, two features. If, if variables is confusing, think about them as features, right? Because they are features. How do features one and two vary with each other? That's captured by the off diagonal term in the covariance matrix. So are we clear about what this covariance matrix is doing? Sir, we are comparing the, uh, with, between two features. But in, in actual equation of covariance, that is uh, C, C is equal to 1y and here we are using xi, xi in both sides, xi minus mu into xi minus mu to transpose. Yes. So yeah, can you tell me the question? The question is, uh, we are comparing for two features. Yes, right. I'm right. You are comparing or, for two features, yeah. Yeah. And what in equation of covariance, the second line C is equal to one upon n sigma one to n. We are using xi and xi in both the both the products. So sides. here is a vector, right? So here it's a vector. So xi xi transpose. Okay, so uh, this is what we were discussing in the matrix multiplication case, right? So think about this. Assume that you have three variables, and this is the 
This is XI, this is XI transpose. Okay. Yes, so sir. you are doing what? You are doing, you are multiplying them in this manner, right? A into D. You get this? Yeah, okay, got it. Okay, so what will happen is here I, it's a three by four matrix, but in reality it will be a three by three matrix, right? This will be DEF. And what sigma xi xi transpose is doing is it's multiplying this over n such data points. Okay, I know it's not very convincing, but uh, you have to kind of take one example and see how it all works. That will clarify things a bit. Okay. This CPQ is just one term in the covariance matrix? It's just one term. So P and Q can range from 1 to 3. So C11 will be the first term, C12 will be the second term, and so on. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. But it so can be any number of variables or features that we have, correct? It's, yeah, it's it is dependent on the features that we have on the problem. Exactly. Right. That's why it's V cross D. And yeah. And we're trying to establish the relationship that each of these features has with the other one. Right. Right. Okay. Clear. Okay. So uh, the main thing you have to take away from all this is that error minimization is somehow leading us to the covariance matrix maximization of this term associated with the covariance matrix. Uh, just one last question. Here, uh, it was, uh, we have said C is equal to 1 by N sigma XI XI transpose, right? Yeah. And yet, when we were looking in the covariance matrix, we you said XI minus nu uh, into XI minus uh, mu transpose. That is the centering, right, Divya? So, that's why, uh, yeah. So, ultimately, we just centered in the covariance matrix, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, mu here is explicitly 0. But even otherwise, the covariance matrix will make sure that you are doing that centering business. Okay. Okay. So that is what we have so far. So in the exam, it is given us if the data is centered, and we can go ahead with this formula. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you will be will will give you whether it's centered or not. Yeah. Okay. So that is what we have. So this is the optimization problem that we finally end up with. And uh, in the last session, we saw that this has a nice solution. Of course, you would have seen it in the videos also. So, what is the solution of this of this problem? Uh, w is the eigenvector corresponding to the highest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. Okay, good. Okay, and what is the so that's the solution to which of these two problems? Left or right? Yes, I guess. Aren't both the same? Mm, OK, so the output of both will be different. But what you're trying to solve is the same. So what will be the output of the left on left, the, the optimization problem on the left? And what will it be on the right? Oh, OK. So the one on the left is basically the output would be the maximum value of the objective function and for the right one it would be the argument for which the objective function is maximum okay great okay so what will be the values actual values uh -huh. so the actual value would be here the eigenvector corresponding to the highest eigen value transpose into c times the again and this would be the on the right would be just the eigenvector corresponding to the highest eigen value of c Okay, so the right part is correct, left is also correct, but what is the simpler way of saying, what does it res result in? W transpose CW, if, if W is an eigenvector of C. Eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector W. That's correct, right? So that's correct. So these are the solutions. So as you said, W1 will be the first or, or the eigenvector corresponding to the largest of these eigenvalues. And W transpose C W will actually be that particular eigenvalue. Okay, so is everyone clear about this? Yeah. Can you repeat the last part, please? Uh, right, left side will be the largest eigenvalue, and the right side eigen... will be the eigenvector that corresponds to I... this eigenvalue. Okay. Okay. okay.
okay any does anyone else have a confusion regarding this uh i had i had i have a question but i don't know if it i mean okay let me just ask it and then you answer it whenever you want because i think it's a bit far ahead uh okay. later on in the videos we actually discussed that this is the first round and then whatever errors or residues that we get we turn it into again into a data set and we again do the same thing and we can do it up to d times d being the dimension of right. the data set uh so is that what we do i mean we do we let if we do it for let's say d times uh, do we calculate or we do we optimize this d different version of this thing or uh is that what we do do we do we do it into d different times the same okay. it's a good question so uh so what we actually do is okay that's the way sara has presented it and that's the right way of presenting it because uh it kind of captures the whole thing but let me just put it this way so you are optimizing this w transpose cw right and this is for the first row so for the first row you have only one direction that you care about yeah hmm. okay so this is for the first round so it's clear so you, i'll write the constraint here separately so the constraint will be norm w equal to 1 right so that's that's what you're doing now for the second round so you could what you're doing is you are taking the residues and you will it, it turns out that the optimization problem with or what you're optimizing is same w transpose cw but you have two constraints now the first constraint remains from w equal to 1 second constraint is w should be perpendicular to the eigen vector that you obtain in the first row okay, so this is not explicitly function but this is what happens sorry could you repeat the second one again so what is happening is you have obtained a w1 as the output of the first round right so the the solution of the first round is that is w1 right the first taken vector correspond the eigen vector corresponding to the largest taken value yes. now in your second round what actually how is it formulated here it's formulated in the following way right you are trying to minimize the reconstruction error of the residues but it so happens that the residues are all so the residues have this property the residues are orthogonal to w1 he sir has mentioned this in the lectures and he has also asked us to prove it ourselves okay all the errors are perpendicular to w1 so yes. there is no point looking for a direction that is not perpendicular to w1 okay so this is intuitively true so i hope you get it right so that you are, you are you have already found out w1 and you have also found out that residues are all perpendicular to w1 then you will continue your search only along those directions which are perpendicular to w1 that's how the second constraint comes about so uh, can we say it another way that each w1 like up to d times between all the w1s are orthogonal to each other exactly yeah so for the third so for the third round or for the eighth round this will this will be pairwise so wi so you would have already established you know by inductively if you think about it in the first i minus 1 rounds you would have already established pairwise independent uh, orthogonality right so you would have already established that first i i minus 1 are pairwise orthogonal so your i thrown will be what it will just be look for those w that that are orthogonal to wj par you no know, j is a starts from 1 all the way up to i minus 1 sir i have a question here sir yeah uh, sir uh, after uh, going through the videos also i am not actually able to correlate that how uh, these uh, w uh, transpose wj is equal to 0 how uh, this is related uh, visually when we talk of the data points for which we are performing this task like we have a data point which is having say d features 
and gradually you know uh, we are trying to get the projection as close as to our uh, onto the line on which we are projecting it and we are trying to minimize the, minimize the errors but sir can you show us uh, visually taking an example of a, a, a live a, a three feature point how visually we can correlate this mathematical aspect to that data set sir uh, okay so that that's there but it will have to um, wait a bit that's yes okay. that um, because mathematically we could follow but you know how in reality those data points how we are getting the important uh, uh, features coming uh, in correlation to the maximum value of uh, eigen value i mean how that thing can we visualize those things if it is possible sir that's right then possible we'll do it in the session uh, okay so we'll try so to get do the further uh, rounds is it to reduce the dimension so we do the further rounds to first because there is information in the residue right as as sir says because you have chosen the most important direction and that doesn't mean that you have captured all possible information available in your data set right so other directions could have more important information so i, I have a slide relating to this uh, related to this in the end but okay. we'll With all the information as much as possible we are going we are searching for further directions also is that correct that's true right that's true okay. so you want to search for you, finally you want to get as few directions as possible which explain as much of the data set as possible okay um can i ask something on the same uh, when we actually do the first time we do a line fit the best okay. line that is yes. yeah the, and the minimization of the errors has happened okay now for the residues it's going to be perpendicular to that i get the residues no right. what is it that i would be getting in the third round like what am i expecting to get in the third round this part is not really clear because okay when you say the jth thing is going to be round after round we keep going and get information but i'm not able to understand what is it that i would be actually looking for more is it okay. again a relation as to what the residues are going to give me uh, information that the residues give me or is the original data itself because original data is already fit onto your line the residues i got in the second round what uh, what right. do we expect so, in the second third and fourth yeah yeah so this is see the residue is what what we have fit after two rounds let's take two rounds and we have found out w1 and we have found out w2 so now what does your point look like your point looks like this right so you take any data point let's call it x so this is x transpose w1 w1 plus yeah. x transpose w2 w2 right so your point looks like this this is your reconstruction rather your reconstruction looks like this now mm -hmm. there will be a residue associated with this also right the earlier what yeah. was the residue yeah. the residue was only this much correct correct so you have you have maybe a smaller residue smaller in some sense and you are going to fit at w3 to this hmm. okay so this is what you'll be doing okay yeah okay, I, i understand i kind of understand that it's algebraically it may be convincing but uh, to uh, think about it visually i think it's tough sir can i ask one question here sir? yeah uh, can you uh, just please revisit that why w2 wj should be zero okay the line should be ortho uh, normal to each other but uh, why you're asking why w2 first of all why even w2 should be orthogonal to w1 yes yes we are searching for another line after the second round and we want that it should be orthogonal to the first line but why it should be orthogonal to the first line okay so very quick example is uh, I'll just give a very quick example. Let's say you have a bunch of points. Okay, so assume that these are your points, right? So I don't know how many I'll be able to draw, but okay, so we have one more point. 
move it there. Assume that this is your best fit line. Okay, this is your best fit line, which is W1. Will this be passing through the origin? Yeah, it, it has to pass, right? It will be passing through the origin. Assume that, okay, for completeness sake, let's draw the origin also. So the origin is, say, like this. And okay, so this is your uh, W1. Now, the question is, why should W2 be perpendicular to W1? Why, why should we even search in that direction? That's because. Let's uh, let me draw the residues. What is the residue going to be for this point? Let's take this point. The residues perpendicular to the line w. of speed. Right? Yeah. So the residues will be perpendicular to W1. Now, not just for this point, but for every point, the residues will be perpendicular to W1. So you are trying to fit a bunch of lines which are a bunch of points which are on this line. OK, so naturally, what you will do is you will only look for this line, right? So in, in do, you, do you get it? Why W2 should be perpendicular to W1? Is it convincing enough or? Yeah, this part is OK. Now, you... just one, one more time. Sure, sure. Yeah, so OK, so see, W, the residues, do you agree, are perpendicular to w1 yeah yes okay so if the residues are perpendicular to w1 then uh, okay let's not take so many points let's only take two points okay assume that so that is that automatically it gets uh, perpendicular to w2 that's what you're about to say yeah 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 if you so, find uh, w2 perpendicular we don't have to look for a perpendicular it's it is it is already there, right? Okay, that's the reason we are going for it. Okay. So this is okay. So this is this may seem very convincing in 2D case because as you said, it is by default there's only one perpendicular line and the residues are only along okay, so the residues are all along the same line, okay. And therefore our task is simple. We only have one line to consider. Yeah. But okay. in the 3D case, it's not so easy. So let me we'll be along a plane, right? We'll be along the... a plane. Yeah, you're right. So I'm just I'll just draw this plane. Kind of uh, so this is what we are trying to do. Okay, so let me just rotate this and let's draw this line here. I have this image later on in the slides, but maybe this is the right thing. So can you all visualize? Yeah, out this? of plane, you mean? Yeah, this plane that is. Uh, going yeah. through this, right? Okay, so this is a plane. Okay, so this should go down. Uh, now, what I'm saying is that consider a point that is there in the space. Okay, now you have projected it onto this line. Okay, you have projected it onto this line. So the residue is going to be what? The residue will be, plane, right? will be perpendicular to the plane, right? So, uh, I mean, so it will lie on the plane, rather. The residue will be, okay, so assume that this is the foot of the point. I have projected this onto this line. So, your residues will be, as we said, the residues will be perpendicular to the line W. So, this is W1. Now, residue is going to be perpendicular to w1 so where will that perpendicular residue lie it has to lie on the plane it right? will lie on the plane it will lie on the plane won't it lie parallel to the plane why only on the plane so your your vector right your residue mind, mind you is a vector okay so one end of the vector will be at the origin and the other end will be wherever it is on the plane that is why we are taking center data so that you know it is sticking to the origin there and everything is with reference to the origin there yeah okay please try to uh, stick with this image for some more time you can go home and or, or whenever you are at home you can try to do this 
for now i think we'll have to move on okay so we'll come back to this uh, can i ask one more thing the yeah. w1 uh, uh, the perpendicular that uh, anything that is perpendicular to w1 there will be only a single line that will be perpendicular and passing through the origin right uh, no it will right be unique w1 well, see there are many perpendiculars to w1 everything every single point on the plane is perpendicular to w1 for example i have drawn once we increase the dimensions then it will be many yeah then there will be even more there will be several more in fact there will be d minus 1 if you are, if you are looking at d dimensions then you will have a subspace which is perpendicular to w1 it will be a d is minus it only two dimensional then then you will have only one direction like there this there will be only one okay so this last, uh, so that's it. Uh, so what I, what I understand is that the plane is there and uh, the point, is, I'm just taking uh, like a shadow of that in that plane so that it converges to one single point rather than a different points scattered together on that plane. I'm trying to get to a po uh, point on the plane. Is that true? Uh, so see, you are... What are you trying to do? You are projecting this point onto to this line. plane. No, not to the plane, right? So, see, you are projecting the point onto the line because that's your first principal component, and the whole point okay. is projected to the principal component. Okay. And then right. what you are doing is you are subtracting the projection from the line, sorry, from the point, and that ends up lying on the plane. So what's my so what updates? My plane stays the same, but my line shifts to the point itself, or the plane shifts. None of this happens, right? So see, you have found mm -hmm. out W one, mm -hmm. and what we are claiming is that all the residues now lie on the plane perpendicular to W one. Plane perpendicular to W one. That can there can be like infinite planes on that line itself. But it should pass through the origin. Okay. All right. Right. So there is that exact one plane which is. Okay. So that is what we are claiming. Can I ask one question here? So yeah. when we say 3D, am I referring to, uh, are we referring to uh, three features or uh, because when we say residue, residue is like I have parameters which are two. And then I am seeing what ex y is equal to mx is what I am looking at. And when I go for planes, it is three dimensional. That is three features. And if I go for multiple features, it is multi dimensional. Is that correct? Because uh, when you say d, d is a different dimension altogether again. So yeah, uh, here we are looking at d equal to three. D equal to three. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. Okay. So okay. yeah, I, I'll try to watch. What I'll try to do is I'll try to get this image a little better next time so that we understand what yeah, man, it's it's clear enough thank you thank you for putting that uh, pictorially but just wanted yes, to understand sir. what thank is you, d sir. and what is this number actually okay okay yeah, yeah. thank you okay so let's let's go back to the optimization problem so this is lambda one and this is w1 right so we are still in the first round and today we'll mostly be you know trying to understand the first round a little bit better so Okay, but you still have the D rounds here, right? So this is the relationship, and you have D eigenvalues corresponding eigenvectors, and that's your setup. Okay. So this I think someone already mentioned very nicely that direction which minimizes the reconstruction there is the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. Okay, so this is done, right? So now now we look at this first principal component and slight, try to understand it slightly better. So what do you think is will be the first principal component here? How will it look like? By the way, you I think you know what the principal component is, right? W1 is the principal component, the first one. And what do you think it will look like here? Closer to y-axis. So we'll pass through all those data points. OK, closer to y-axis is fine but when, when you say pass through all data points will it be like a free curve which passes no. through all the data no 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 it's a straight line uh, best fit line right. basically okay i agree so it looks something like this can we say yes sir yeah. Yeah. yes sir. okay now i'm asking you this question 
So what do you think these points are? So they are, they actually mean something. To me, they mean something because I, I have the context with me. But to you, what, what does it mean? It is negatively correlated. OK, uh, all right. That is one uh, observation or inference it, that you can it draw. It varies along the y-axis rather than the x-axis. The points are uh, closely connected together. Because uh, we can see that they are not scattered, they are moving in a and the variance is large fashion. along this direction. Yeah, so these are all observations. I agree. One points one are the matrix. Nice actually, is the X doesn't seem to have a effect on the Y. Okay, agreed. But from a, these are all, I would say, more of a mathematical or a visual geometric perspective, right? So I, I totally get it. That's correct. But can you say something else about the data? Hello, sir. Yeah. Small change of x, there is a high change of y. Mm, OK. Uh, can you say something qualitative about the data? Qualitative in the sense that is? They are forming cluster kind of thing. Like they are very tightly. OK. Uh, they are the dense. Is less in the they data. are dense. Than, yeah. The va variance is very less in the data, right? Standard deviation and variance is very low. OK, right. So yeah, so I mean, I, it's an unfair question that I'm asking, but I'll just show you where I got these points from. It'll be interesting. Do you see what these points are actually? The road towns, trip. Towns, is it? Highway, maybe. Towns and cities. OK, so OK, so I mean, these are not actual data points. I have kind of cooked them up, but the the map behind you is real. So this is actually the all the stops from Chennai to Delhi on Garibrath Express, right? So there's one Chennai to Delhi Garibrath uh, train, and that stops in all these places. And what I've drawn, you can think about it as a very noisy GPS signal, right? So assume that you have a very no noisy GPS signal as you travel on this train, and that's giving you some data about your latitude and longitude and you take the data back home you plot it okay and you apply pca on the data and you get the first principal component okay, now can you tell me what this principal component represents it's Shortest the best fit which covers all the cities for that particular train is that correct right so yeah so uh, i mean i would put it this way right? so yeah Maximum it gives, covers the maximum number of cities, this fit line. Right. So, I, yeah, that's correct. So, I, I would put it this way. It's like the direction of your travel, right? Roughly, what is the direction of your travel? If you want to summarize it as a single line, then that line is a simple line connecting Chennai and Delhi. OK, so that's how I would describe it. So why am I doing all this? There's a point, a larger point to be made. So I, I just removed the point so that you can see the actual path of the train. Okay, so that's the first principal component that it's is shown in front of you, right? So yeah, so data is given to you in the form of a matrix. Right? You all agree about this. Data is given to you in the form of a matrix, and at the end of the day, it's something very abstract. Okay, it's a bunch of numbers, it's abstract. Abstract and what we teach you in the course is a lot of algorithms which are general purpose and they're extremely powerful. Okay, so just to give you an idea of how powerful these algorithms are, your domain could be say transportation like this, it could be biotechnology, it could be uh, say computer science, core computer science, whatever it is, you can do the same TCA, you can apply it on the data that comes from that particular area. OK, so but none of you were able to answer the question that I asked simply because not because you don't understand PCA, but because you didn't have the domain knowledge. Right. So I didn't tell you what the domain was. I didn't give you any context. Right. So if you actually go and apply your PCA onto some random data set, which you are totally disconnected from, there is very little insight that you can extract from it. OK, so. In this case, once you knew what the domain was, at least now that you know the domain, imagine how how much value there is to this line. Okay, so it's no longer just a principal component; it's actually literally the direction, 
the most important direction right so there is something more than uh, some mathematical construct that you are looking at right so i just want you to keep this in mind because it often gets lost right when you go out and apply these algorithms on data sets okay so that's a small aside now we come back variance i think some of you mentioned variance so let's understand this variance better because it's a small catch here okay so i want you to focus on this so assume that the red color dot right that's the mean and you have a bunch of blue color data points and sigma 1 square is the variance of this data set it's all one dimensional data set so this is how it looks now consider another data set Okay, so what can you say about sigma 2 square? How is it related to sigma 1 square? It's greater than sigma 1 square. Okay, that is correct. Now I have one more. So if you put them together, what can you say? The sigma 3 is maximum variance. Okay, right. So you have this nice relationship, sigma 1 square less than sigma 2 square less than sigma 3 square. Now, is high variance a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing for considering PCA because to reconstruct the data, we need the maximum variance, right? Uh, okay. So even before going there, if you just, if I just say throw the word variance, usually I mean, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm used to. Yeah, generally know, variance should be less, but in here. So with, ge with general knowledge, variance should be less, and it is a bad thing. Having high variance is bad. Okay. So why suddenly does it become good in the case of? This PCA. Yeah, because if it is overlap while reconstructing, we cannot get the original data, right? Only if it, the variance is very high, we can get back the original data reconstructing, right? Is it okay? Correct? Okay, that is uh, one way to capture more property of the data. Okay, to capture more property, okay, fine. That's also that. Anyone else? Overlap, uh, some of the information would be lost, right? If two data say lie on the same point. That's correct, right? That's correct. Yeah. So that is that's the answer that I'm looking for. So that we spend very small amount of time on this aspect of variance when you take it out of the PCA context. So for example, let's say you are measuring the temperature of some object, right? You are in a physics lab, you are measuring the temperature and your your uh, device is faulty. So your device is not so good. So you get a lot of variance. You end up getting a lot of variance in your measurements. So variance is bad in that case. Okay? You don't want that much variance. So the variance that we are talking about in PCA is not that kind of a variance. Okay, So that is something we have to be very clear about. What we mean by variance in this context, even though the quantity is, the way it is defined is same, what we associate with it is different. Okay, that's the first point. So the next is, say, now we'll come to the PCA context. So if you look at weight here, what can you say about the variable weight, the feature weight? For the same the weight, the height varies. Yeah. Height is independent of weight, it seems. OK, height is independent of weight. That's interesting. So. Is weight useful at all? No. No. OK, why is weight not useful? Very less. Sir, height is varying, but weight is constant. Almost constant, yes. Almost constant, but height okay. is varying. So why is that a problem? If weight is constant, why, why should it bother us? I can because then it has less weight. confidence. When Saying anything point. about the data point. Yes, I cannot predict height taking weight into consideration. OK, right. So all this is correct. So weight doesn't give me any information about the data, right? It, it's you could as well throw out the weight and nothing would have changed, correct? I can I, I can just throw out the weight as a feature, and I don't lose anything in the process. Now what about this? This is clearly better, right? Because you have some information contained in weight. At least you can make statements like, you know, people with the low weight, of course, this is not true. I'm just building this up, cooking this up. People having a low weight seem to have a low height, small height. And people who are bulkier 
or taller because this is all wrong but at least from whatever data i have just hooked up that's what it seems like okay so weight is having some information so what weight do we mean by with height sorry we can say that weight is related with height right yeah well, in some sense right yeah so weigh in pca context it means information and it also means explanatory power okay so in the in the graph on the left the weight as a feature does not have any power to explain your data okay it's powerless so that's not what we want we want it to have some capacity to explain the data so so and that is measured using this quantity called variance right how much spread there is in your data okay i hope this idea of variance is clear mm, this is what we were trying to do in the in the previous example also this line happens to be the line of maximum variance okay so we are actually looking now for a line which will give us maximum variance okay so we move to this next setup of variance maximization for the moment leaving behind error minimization sorry to interrupt sir can you move back to the previous slide yeah so, sir here what is the explanatory power means so what i mean by explanatory power is uh see what are we looking for in in the case of representation learning in the first four weeks at least we don't we are looking at unsupervised learning problems meaning we are given a data set and we want to explain some patterns or discover some patterns in the data set okay so what is a pattern a pattern could be some kind of a linear pattern like this it could be some non linear pattern like circles right in your feature space so i need to be capable of capturing those patterns and explaining them okay and what do i have with me in my toolkit features right i have to work with features in some way so that i can capture these patterns so i turn to my features and i find out that this this weight in this case on the left hand side is a totally meaningless feature okay because it's giving me no uh what do i say information about my data set right so you you take 100 people and you are studying their health attributes and height and weight are two such attributes and you find that everyone has the weight in the range 60 to 65 kg no can you use the weight to conclude anything meaningful about your data no sir no right so if everyone is of the same weight so i can't make even simple statements like you know if you if you are a, if you are obese then something and something will happen right so you you know the usual statements that we make in statistics right so i, I can't make any such statements simply because there is no variation in weight everyone is having more or less the same weight and that is what i call explanatory power right how well can i explain my data so we are saying we will trying to look for features which have more variance yeah right so variance whenever we say variance in the pca context you have to immediately think about that as information or spread or diversity things like this or the explanatory power right that's the more of the yeah that's the main thing right so if yes, i can it use it as a pivot to separate my data set in some sense then i am happy sir uh, does that mean that before doing a pca we can go for uh, analyzing the data using various combinations uh, through scatter plot you can do that but see the problem is uh, that, that's okay that's a good idea but pca actually does that for you right you will we'll see that pca is actually doing that for you it's it's giving you the direction in which the variance is maximum so why would you want to do it yourself manually okay right? sir so we'll come to that we'll come to that so when we're talking about variance as maximum and we're talking about covariance matrix uh, are we referring to the relation between two features which is the most significant uh good point that's not exactly but that's a good point right so you have to we'll come to that I, I, so your question is so I, I the larger question is are we talking about pairs of features and mm -hmm. how do they relate and is is there enough variance contained there or is it something else when we mean by variance right so correct correct 
that's a good question we'll come to that so in this slide we'll we'll clearly define what we mean by variance sir okay. one more question please sir yeah. Uh, does this PCA take care of uh, collinearity between various features? Like I have five features and three features are uh, correlated to each other. So will this PCA help me eliminate those things or will it be influenced by collinearity of those features? Uh, so PCA will help you decorrelate them, meaning so if they are correlated, then PCA will find those directions which are decorrelated. So it will, yeah, it will help in decorrelating your data set. How it does that is something we'll have to look at, but that's what it does. Okay, so what do we mean by variance here? It's, it's let's take the simple example. You have a data set of, let's say, four points, blue points, right? That's your data set. And then you are projecting them. Can I, can, can, uh, sorry, can I interject for the last question? So yeah. the 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 data points which are highly correlated will come together. Their projections will be very close. So when you project the data, they will be closer in on one of the one of the principal components. So they will become one of the principal components. Uh, can you repeat that Vasu, once again, please? I'm saying. I, I'm saying data which is uh -huh. highly correlated. Let's say you have a data set, and in that there are, there are data points or whatever features are highly correlated. Right. Then they will be closer to all of them, which are closer will come together and get projected on the same principal component. So they'll be closer to that principal component. Okay. Okay. All of them. So if you if you plot the projected values. They will be whatever are highly correlated will be close to a certain principal component. Let's say you have 100 features. There mm -hmm. are 10 which are highly correlated, another 10 which are highly correlated, another 10. And mm -hmm. if you plot them on a principal, you can't visualize them, but just think of it like that. You plot mm -hmm. them on a, you plot the projected values, and your mm -hmm. principal components are the new axis. Then these 10 will be close to one principal component. The other 10 will be close to another principal component. The other 10 will be close to another principal component. The idea of idea of using principal component in regular kind of when you take industry related work is to actually reduce and bring all these correlated things together. OK, OK. Right. Instead of dealing with 100 features, I can deal with only 10 features now or whatever, 10 components. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the the idea is dimensional reduction is to do that. So which is why they will come together near. They'll come together. And if you plot them back on the principal component or the axis, you will see all of those points close to one of the components. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So, so what we have here is the Variant, right? So, what do we mean by variance? So, what do you think is from this diagram? What do you think is going to be the variance? Distance from the center to the yeah, you are right. So, distance from center to how sparse the data are projected, projected points. Distance that is the variance, right? Are Correct. Yeah. So, the variance is nothing but how. The distance from the green points, which are the projected points, to the red, which is the center, right? And of course, the square of this distance, and you just have to add them together. Okay, so this is what we mean by variance of a data set along a direction W. Okay, so this is very important because we keep talking about variance maximization, and it's important to understand what this variance is, and because there is a notion of what is called the total variance, which is not the same as this variance. Okay, So when we say variance maximization, we are talking about maximizing the variance of the data set along this direction w. Okay, For now, that's all we are concerned with. So what will be the variance? It will be 1 by n sum of xi transpose w whole square. OK, does everyone get this part? Yes, Yes. Okay. okay. So what is D here? What is D here? D is the data set, right? Your data set that's given to you. 
and you are talking about the variance of the data set D when it is projected on to a direction W. So, of course, you have left out the D, but just to make it clear. Is this XIT W whole squared uh, derived from what we had done earlier? Mm, no, right? So, in fact, it will lead to that, but this is not coming from that. Do you see why? So, okay. So, do you see why it is XI transpose W whole square? Because see, what is the variance? Variance is how far you are away from your mean, right? Essentially, that's what it's capturing. Yes. So, the, the, way, the distance of the green color point from the mean is X1 transpose W. That's the distance. That is what we are calculated as C in the scalar quantity. Uh, no, no. <clears throat> really? So, okay, so let me just, so what, see, this is what we are trying to say. Just, we have a bunch of values, say, uh, these are the projections, right? X1 transpose W is the projection of the first point on the principal component. X2 transpose W the projection of the second point on the principal component and so on till x let's say i have only four points x4 transpose w but isn't this bracket is just the scalar quantity don't we multiply it by w to get the projection that's the projection yeah but this is the scalar projection right just the scalar part of it but just the scalar part of it so you are okay if you want to think about it as the vector projection that's also right but then you want to take the magnitude of that right you want to take the distance of that you want to know how far away from the origin is this vector. So how far will this vector be from the origin? This is the distance from the origin, right? This is the length of the vector, basically. OK, yeah, got it. So that becomes this. And then you are taking the variance of these four quantities. And therefore, so this we transpose w. So the variance is nothing but some of these squares of this, since the mean is zero. Okay. okay so I hope it's clear. Just repeat the last one that you have taken the norm, so it denotes the distance, no? Norm, therefore, it denotes the distance. Now, what you want is the variance, right? Variance is what sigma x minus mu whole square, right? See, uh, this x1 transport w that denotes the projection. Yeah, x1. So these are the projections. Now, what I'm saying is. Uh, you want to find the distance of these points from the origin, which is xi transpose w norm of this. Okay, this is the distance, but what is the variance of this quantity? This minus the mean, right? Mean is zero, so yeah. 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 Okay, so norm square is nothing but. Uh, then we divide by n, right? Yeah. And then we divide by n because you want to, yeah, that's the formula of variance, right? Average of the square distance deviations from the mean. Yeah, okay. okay so let's move on. So xi transpose w yes, square, and then we sum them, divide by n, you get the variance. Now, sir, so it basically boils down to same variance what we have studied so far, right? Same variance. Like whatever we have studied so far in stats one and stats two, like basically the sum of squares of you know uh, distance from the center, right? Yeah, yeah, it's so the same. Average, yeah, it is boiling average, not some average, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the same variance that there is. So there is only one variance. Only. But, but 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 we started our discussion stating that you know the variance has different connotation uh, with respect to PCA. We should not take it in the same way which we have studied. So this you know these two seem to be a conflicting statement for me. Uh, so not really. Space. See what I'm saying is, very. I'm 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 not, I'm not saying that variance is different from one context to another. But okay, in whether the, you want to okay. maximize the variance or not. Whether you want to minimize or maximize the variance depends on the context. Okay. Okay. Right. So in one context, so in, I mean, other, in other cases, generally we intend to minimize variance, but in case of PCA, we are intending to maximize variance. Is the understanding correct? That is correct. Yeah. 
Okay, I mean, in, so, yeah. Uh, this variance is same as uh, the Eisen value, right? Yeah, we come to that. Yeah, that is correct. Thank you. Right. So now we do the same algebra trick that we did earlier, and this becomes the coherence matrix C. Okay, W transpose C W, and now we can claim that the maximum of W transpose C W, that direction which maximizes the variance, is nothing but the first the eigen vector corresponding to the largest eigen vector. Okay, so we have come to the same result, albeit in a different direction. Okay, so is this clear to everyone? Yeah, uh, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, will you visualize this by taking some example that the blue point is a data or it's a feature? <clears throat> w is neither data no, nor feature. No, no, the blue points, you are oh, taking blue, the projection okay. on the line which is a green. Right, right. Blue or uh, blue is the is a data points. Data points. And, and the green are projections, yeah. So uh, you are measuring the data points with uh, features, mean features. Means various means you are taking uh, different something like no. Sorry, can you come again? We are evaluating a variance here. Yeah, okay. we, are so we are evaluating the difference. So in the scenario of the data points, how we can correlate it? Okay, so we see. have the features and we have the data points, and then we are taking the difference, uh, something like that, difference of one feature with a uh, data point, something like that. Uh, okay, so how it connects to features, I'll come to that, right? So I'll come to that. But if you are, question is, how, what, what is the variance all about? It's the, it's the variance in these, the distances of these green points from the origin. Red point here. Uh, from the yeah, from the red point. Yeah. How far away are my projections from my origin? Okay. How spread out are they? The more spread out they are, the better is my W. Okay. The higher is my variance, the better is my choice of W. So I am looking for that line where they are most spread out. Okay. Okay. Because as we have argued earlier. The more spread out they are, the more information that particular line contains about the data set. So can you talk about only one feature that uh, we are taking the average, one feature average that is the blue uh, red point, and then we are measuring all different data points from that. We are am I, not. Am I correct? Uh, okay, so we are not measuring the, it's not one feature, right? We are taking the projection of the data point on a line. and the distance of this projection from the line is what we are concerned with. How far away are my projections from my red point? So if they are really far away, if they are like if they are all spread out, then I am happy. Okay. Okay. Um, may I ask a question here related yeah. to the lambda that is written over there? Okay, we get the largest eigenvalue. No, from the context of eigenvalues, when you say it is ax is equal to lambda x, correct? Correct. Okay. So how do I actually, um, I'm trying to get back to that relation. Is there a possibility of getting back to that relation by Hello. Uh, uh, equating this somewhere, uh, saying lamb if I multiply x on both sides and then say ax and then do I get back this uh, wtcw? Um, Covariance matrix in the directional vector. Will I be finding a relation there? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. So if you multiply both sides by x. I mean here you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Then I get lambda lambda x. Um so why would you want to do that? I'm just trying to understand mathematically is there a relevance or a significance? Okay, see this W1 is the eigenvector, right, corresponding to lambda 1. <clears throat> so <throat> the reason you get w lambda 1 here is that C w1 is lambda 1 w1. Right, so w, trans, mm -hmm. w1 transpose C w1 will translate to w1 transpose w1 into lambda 1. Right, so it's repeat, like, repeat that part, please. Repeat the last part once again, please. Uh, okay. So what we are, what I'm saying is we are, so when we say w transpose C w, the solution to this is that W is the eigenvector 
corresponding to the largest eigen value so in fact how we get to the maximum is because of this right so it is w1 w1 transpose lambda 1 w1 which is nothing but lambda 1 okay, so this is how we have come to lambda 1 now okay. it may not make sense to go back to uh, by multiplying by w1 may not be the right thing right at this stage right so that is clear yeah, maybe maybe it'll take some more time to digest. I was just looking at all the formula that has been taught. So, trying to think the relation. Yeah. <coughs> so, can you go back? To... Yeah. Sorry, boss. We are carrying on. Sorry, uh, GP. Just one second. See, around this, now, there's a uh, uh, prof also had uh, done some derivation. There's a bit of a confusion there also, Karthik. If, once you finish okay. this, if you can just open the slide, I can show it to you. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, once you finish. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, can, yeah, can we go back to this slide? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, like going back to that height and weight example, right? Okay. Uh, so, for example, with the help of, uh, you know, uh, let us be on this slide only, sir. Let us be on that slide only. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, uh, we are trying to predict height with this, uh, you know, with the help of uh, height. Sorry, we are trying to predict height with the help of weight, right? Right. So, can we say that this graph represents one feature or two feature? This is uh, two features, right? We are say height and weight. But uh, height is the output, no? So we are taking the help of uh, weight to predict the uh, height, right? So it's one feature. Uh, I think, no, right? no, no. So we are not in the predictive zone at all, right? So we are still in unsupervised learning where we don't know what is the dependent variable, what is okay, the okay, variable. okay. So going like that, it's uh, there are two features, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay, so. Uh, if you move on, so this is the summary of what we have been seeing so far that these two perspectives are equivalent. So whether you look at it as error minimization or variance maximization, the point of contact is the principal component and it's the same solution for both the problems. Okay, so now we come to one slightly different way of understanding the PC. Your error, so, by error, we mean residue. Ah, uh, yeah, the reconstruction. Right. Error. Yes. Reconstruction, correct. Okay. So, slightly different way of understanding what the principal component is. So, consider now we are looking at features, right? Look at, think about D features and what is the length? I mean, not the length, but what is this projection? What's the scalar projection of X on the line, W? It's transpose W transpose w right so let's expand it if i expand it what do i get i get something like this do you agree yeah okay now think about x1 to xt as variables as features okay the features you can plug in any value like but for the moment forget specific values and think about them as d variables corresponding to the d features so what your principal component is actually doing is it is linearly combining your D features in a particular way. Okay, your first principal component or any principal component for that matter is actually a linear combination of your features. Okay, so if you take height and weight as an example, then height into two plus weight into three, that might be your principal component, right? So that's another way of thinking about a principal component so this is also important okay so this did everyone get what this means sir can you repeat what you sir, said can you repeat it again, sir, okay so see uh so far what have we been looking at we have been saying that we have been talking about two things right first is find that line w which is going to give me the least error in terms of reconstruction that is perspective one we then realize that it's the same as saying find that line which is going to give me maximum various variance along that line right so which line gives me maximum variance call that w and it, and surprisingly both of them are the same line okay both of them point to the same way so that is what we have understood so far Okay, so now what is this line? We can also understand it as 
some combination of your existing features. See, after all, you start with features that are given to you, right? You have D features, OK? So from where did this point suddenly jump out? Okay, visually, you say it's it's that line which is passing through the center of some cloud of data. All that is fine. But if you want to plug it into a computer, let's say, what are you really doing? You're, you're saying that my line is actually some combination of features. OK, maybe 2 into height plus 3 into weight. Yeah, so I do some kind of combination. And what PCA does is it gives me the recipe to combine these features in a certain way. So PCA is going to give me W11. It's going to give me WI1. It's going to give me these D values. And that recipe is how to how do I combine my features linearly so that I can get a new feature. So think about this as a new feature. Okay, you had D features to begin with. You have put them all in a mixy and you have come up with one new feature. And the speciality of this new feature is that maximum information is contained along this feature. Does that sound convincing? Or is it still unclear? So yeah, because because uh, because W1 corresponds to the highest uh, lambda eigenvalue, so it will have the maximum information or maximum variance. Ah, uh, right. That is the variance maximization perspective. But it's what it's I'm saying is, it's the same thing. Conceptually, it's the same thing. Right? Information or variance. Ah, uh, no. Yeah, that's the that's true. But what I'm saying is, that is the variance part of it, right? Variance or information part of it. But this is more of Okay, how does it tie back to the features? Okay, so okay, all this is fine. You are you are giving me a good direction that maximizes variance, but how is this direction related to my features? Okay, so it's related to the features in this way, right? If you combine the features linearly, meaning something into feature one plus something into feature two, if I keep doing right. that and add them together, I get my new feature. Correct. Uh, right? Sir, your W one is a constant or a variable, sir. W11 is well the output of your PCA process, right? So you you can treat it as a constant in that sense, but it depends on your data. So it, it depends on performing PCA and getting the output from it. So, so uh, X1 so is a constant, right? So X, yeah, X is a constant. X1, X1, okay. So X1 to XD here, you must treat them like variables. Okay, uh, I'm, so I'm calling them. Am I audible? Yeah. Sir, um, I just wanted to understand when I, we are saying here in imagination, like we are trying to reduce the difference between this uh, blue dot and the green dot. Uh, we are, sorry, we are? When we are saying error minimization, we are trying to reduce the difference between the blue dot and the green dot. Is it? Uh, well, see. For a given line, mm -hmm. this green dot is fixed. Okay, blue dot is always fixed. Okay, okay. For a given line, the green dot will always be fixed. Okay, for a given line. Yeah, sir. Okay, now you're, no, you're. If you want to, if you just have one point, then what will you do? You'll just choose the line that passes through the blue dot and matter closed. Okay, so there's nothing to do there. But if you have multiple points. Then if you move close to one point, you will move far away from some other point. Mm -hmm. OK, so you want to find that line which kind of manages to go right through the heart of that data set so that, that on an average, in an average sense, the distance of your line from these blue dots are minimized. OK, okay so you should not look at it for just a single point, but for a collection of points, which is your data set. Got it. Sir, 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 so what you're trying to say that, you know, say, for example, uh, you said that two times height plus three times weight, right? Yeah. We got an expression, right? So this new expression is my new very feature, what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. So so how it is helping me? Because I started with two features and my now new expression, it, you know, it still has two features, right? So where that question of dimensionality no, is no, not no, 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 uh, no, GP. If you let's yeah. say started with hundred features, 
and you decided right. to have 10 fact 10 principal components so you have only 10 yeah. features now okay okay that, the, that's the, fine. But, but but sticking to the current discussion as what we no, no, this is just that a, you know this, to... is, this is just a toy example to show you will never do it for if you have two features and all you never do all this you will only do it when you have 100000 mm -hmm. features right this is just okay. a way to illustrate is what my guess is i, I kartik can correct me but yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to explain. Yes. Um, but uh, those 10 features, uh, they are the linear combinations of those 100 features, right? Each of those correct. 10 features. Correct. Uh, correct. Okay. Correct. 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 Yeah. So, but each hmm. of those uh, like 10 features, they do contain all 100 features, right? Like in form of a linear combination. Yeah, they will contain, they will contain all the 100 features in certain weights, in certain proportions. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have the final thing is this quick demo. Uh, so this is again for the toy example. I've taken 100 points in R2. Okay, so this is how the data looks like. So how did I compute the covariance matrix? It's very simple. So you take x, one data point, let's say 1, comma 2, you do xx transpose, you get 1, 2, 2, 4. Okay, this is for one data point. Now what do you do? You add all these matrices for the end data points so that you end up with a covariance matrix like this. Okay, so you get this covariance matrix. Now, what you do is in the MLT at least, we will never ask you to solve for lambda or w. Okay, that we won't do. So either you will already be given some information or you'll be able to figure it out in a certain sense right so we won't ask you to solve this what is called the eigenvalue problem so assume that you have some solver that gives you lambda one and w1 so what you do next is case lambda one turns out to be 2.5 and w1 is this line okay so if you plot w1 this is the first principal component right it looks like this it's, it's in the third quad quadrant but the line is this okay so here this is what I was talking about in the previous slide, right? So you're how do you combine your features x1 and x2 to get a new feature? You combine it like this, right? You use the first principal component, you take 0.79, okay, minus 0.79 from of x1, and you take minus 0.61 of x2, and you get this new feature called w1. Okay, and this got it, sir. Got it, right? sir. So yeah. this is this is what is so happening. W is the new feature. W one is the new feature. Yeah. So um, you... W one is a new feature and is representing the line that we just found out. So or... W one is. So what is W one actually? It is the distance of each data point. It's correct. It's the projection, right? So correct. On if you start thinking about this number line, this new number line, which is in red color, as your mm -hmm. only representation of your data. Mm -hmm. Then this is the coordinate of each data point. Okay, so this is just one principal component, right? Of course, there'll be many, but if you just think about the first principal component and you're stopping with that, then W1, this value will give you the representation of your data point on this principal component. Okay, that single coordinate. I have one. So it'll question. come and land on that line. It'll come like and land on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, if PCA creates a uh, com linear combinations of features, then uh, how does it help in selecting the features? The feature selection. PCA helps in selecting the features, right? Yeah. So, to answer your question, the new features become the features for further analysis. You won't look at the original features anymore. Let's say you had 100 features originally, and now the new features are 10 because of 10 principal components. No, no, no. I, mean, I understand that point. I wanted to understand if, uh, suppose we take the housing example, right? So there are five features, the size of the house, uh, the location of the house, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. And I want to select just the two features. PCA doesn't help when you have four or five. You have 100, 200. No, 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 no. Just expand that horizon to 100. Yeah, take 100. Huh? So the 
let's say you have a first principle component which is a combination of certain features then those are the features which are contributing to the maximum eigenvalue so you choose the features which are forming the the basic principle component there's something called as factor loadings or whatever you get these principal component loadings which are uh, your I'm projected values I'm understanding this clearly initially because uh, if i have uh, suppose 100 features or 1000 features it doesn't matter because every principal component is a linear combination of those 1000 features i want only 10 features out of those uh, 1000 features how does mm. the pc will help them? because i need the exact that features not the linear combinations of those features because if i have to take the linear combinations of all those thousands features uh, my problem will remain the same i won't be able to identify which feature is affecting so you want to identify the original features which you want to, you want to select a small exactly. pool of the original features exactly this is how we do generally any data analysis right yeah i know that so I have the answer, but it's slightly, it's going to take time. I don't know how much you know about factor loadings or whatever, how the outputs of some of these outcomes look like. If you can read up something like that, then maybe I can help you because there is a way of doing it, but it's slightly more, it's not direct as simple as this. We gonna study it further or something? I don't know, that Karthik has to say, he's the TA. I'm just a student like you. Uh, so you're asking how we end up with some set of new features, is it? Uh, no, no. I understand this concept, the linear combinations. My question is, BCA help us uh, basically get the dimensionality reductions, right? Correct, yeah. So there we select a number of features. So we don't select, right? BCA selects them for us. How, how does it do that? Will it come in future lectures or? So how does it do it? It so you see it, it chooses a subspace, right? It chooses some subset of features which solve this optimization problem, right? So it maximizes variance and minimizing reconstruction error. So the solution to that objective function results in certain directions which are the most optimal in some sense. So you want to know how that happens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, just like you explain everything, so uh, because your explanation is very uh, basically clear, crystal clear. Okay, so how it happens? Okay, so if it happens in future lectures, I'm okay. Okay, Monday we'll try to do. I can't give a how it happens exactly, but so it it realigns see. If, it helps. What it does is basically it realigns your coordinate axis. It rotates it and aligns it along these directions. Of I think he doesn't. He doesn't want that. Uh, those are the those are the principal components. What he is looking for is if let's say I start with twenty variables, like like, like the example is given, housing, right? It could be location, pricing, number of bedrooms, whatever, right? Uh, okay. And I use principal component to reduce that data to some, let's say if I take five factors or whatever, five principal components. Right? Then I get the feature, those five become the new features, but he doesn't want that. What he's asking is, can I use this to figure out what are the top five variables or six variables to pick from the original data set? Exactly, exactly. Right? That so is feature selection, right? That's not... That is, uh... Yeah, yeah. So how do you, that's what he's saying. How do you... How do you, uh, I know how to do it in context of factor analysis. I don't know in terms of PCA. How do you use PCA for feature selection? Okay, so actually you don't use PCA for feature selection, right? Because you, that's not what you do, right? So feature selection is probably more, we, we study about feature selection when we study regression, okay? So, okay, okay. okay, when we study regression, there is something called your, there's something called a lasso method, which is, which will, select the most relevant features for solving the regression problem okay but here we are not doing feature selection in fact what we are doing is we are making use of all the features available and getting new features and so uh, i think i got it so basically uh, pca doesn't help with the feature selections pca basically help us uh, 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 basically compress the data so that processing can be faster right 
mm, that is all right so uh, not, so compressing is one part of it you will also use the features you might also use the features in some downstream tasks for example pca can be the first pre processing step that you do for your data set which is then fed into some say classification algorithm okay so in that sense you could call it will, will you call it feature selection no it's basically not? feature extraction uh feature extraction feature selection it basically your 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 data reduction they are called data reduction data it it will become the data reduction correct right? yeah but will i am i comfortable calling it feature feature selection i know no, no, it's not feature selection it's data not. reduction yeah yeah you are we can say dimensionality yeah. reductions might be because the dimensions get reduced uh, the data compression because data get reduced as well if you go to any of the big softwares like spss sas and all factor and this will be under pca will be under data reduction yeah so uh, feature selections won't be one of the criteria there is there is honestly speaking there is a way of doing it but it's a slightly convoluted way of doing it there's a paper i can share it with you if you want to go through it you can go through it yeah yeah that that, that will help Okay. On yeah. So point, on the same point, may I ask something? Okay, when we are talking about the uh, eigenvalues that we are finding, we are finding the most significant, significant ones, and the least significant ones, any which ways we are uh, finding, but we are not going to use them. Correct? We are not going mm -hmm. to use those features. Correct? Which are uh, giving those relationships. We going to so see, it's a combination of features, right? So there are. Right. Um, corresponding to your say the smallest eigen value let's say mm -hmm. there'll be some combination of features that results in say the last eigen vector correct okay, just, so you will not you will obviously be throwing those combinations away they are not useful combinations correct in that process will i be eliminating any of the features not as a mandatory thing but is that a possibility that's, that's just thought potentially but uh, see since you are mixing the whole thing up we can can i say that you are going to eliminate one entire feature altogether i don't think so okay okay, okay. that's what i wanted to understand yeah okay okay so and then just finish it we'll meet again on monday because we may have to some of them were not part of this session so i just yeah. just for the sake of completion i complete this so why do we do centering because for a certain reason so this you already know this is centered so i have drawn the data set and i have drawn the principal component here now can someone tell me what if i apply pc on this without centering what do you think will be the first principal component how will it look like it will something i want to it probably will go from the left bottom to right top okay, why do you think that happens That's correct. But the first first component. Maximum variation. The principal component is actually the best fit line, no? Okay, I'll right? go with that. So how how will it look like? So actually, look the other way around, right? Like for example, right hand bottom to left hand uh, up. That's how you expect it to look, right hand bottom to left hand up. But what uh, Ravi mentioned is actually correct. It it goes from left hand okay. bottom. Uh, to right hand button. Okay, so why is this happening? Okay. The covariance is high, sir. Covariance between the different features is. Uh, no, we subtract. We subtract the mean from the from each data point. So, it, you know, the origin shifts. So we are basically. Okay, so we are not subtracting. Right? So that's the point. We are not centering it here. So we are we are applying PCA, not on the covariance matrix, but on something that is not means mean centered. So. Oh. Okay, so please think about it. You are, you are there. So what what's happening is that since you are not means subtracting, the direction of maximum variance for this data set, okay, is going to be this. Why? Because if you think about the distances of these points from the origin, almost oh, every okay. single point is so far away from the origin. Okay, so this is going to be the direction which is having maximum variance as opposed to this direction. Okay, this this direction, this particular one. 
will not have a lot of variance, right? Because you will have a lot of points which are close to the origin if you project them. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we have to center the data set. If not, we'll end up getting something nonsensical like this. Okay, the other reason, of course, is that uh, this is an assumption. I think Sar also mentioned this. The assumption is that structurally, you expect the data to live in a lower dimensional subspace. Oh. Okay, you expect the data to live in a low dimensional subspace. Meaning, oh. if your data is 100 dimensional, to begin with, then you kind of expect it to live in, say, some 20 dimensional subspace. And the moment you say subspace, we are talking about vector spaces. The moment you talk about vector spaces, you are talking about vectors which pass through the origin. Okay, in vector space, that's the only vector. Okay, if you if you think if you recall affine spaces that you studied in Max Two, they are lines which do not pass which do not necessarily pass through the origin. They have some intercept. But if you take a vector space, it does not have any intercept. It always passes through the origin. Okay, and since we are making this assumption, if you if you recall the very first slide, what was the constraint that we started off with? All points should lie on a line passing through the origin. Okay, so for all these reasons put together, centering is critical in PCA. Okay, so I'll just finish with maybe this, this slide. Arthi, can you just go back? Two slides ago, please. Achha, okay, finish up. Uh, just one more slide back. One more slide back. Uh, one more slide back, is it? Yeah. No, before this. Before this. Uh, one more, sorry. The uh, linear combination. Yeah. Just want to check something over there on this. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So the final point is uh, maybe then the time. So just to give you the idea of what happens in the other direction. So assume you have 100 points in in space, right? In R3. So in, this is in three-dimensional space. So you have a data set that is 3 cross 100. OK? So think about this data set as the motion of a particle in space. Okay, motion of a particle in space. So you are just collecting the position of the particle at different time steps. Okay, at different time steps, you are collecting the position of the particle. And it so happens, so happens that this particle is traveling on a plane. Okay, it's actually in space, but it's not going all over the space. It's it's stuck to a plane. Okay, and it's along this direction. So if you do PCA on this data set, what do you think will be the first principal component? Uh, the plane itself, sir. On the plane itself, okay. But along what direction? There are many directions on the plane, right? So what direction do you think you are likely to get? Seems like a sinusoidal curve, at least from what is drawn over here. So I would actually take the center as I mean, the place where the axis is meeting, the plane, and through that okay. draw a line. OK, uh, so the Making first thing like will be, OK, so if you go back to that train example that we were discussing, what did the first principal component capture that? So where is the maximum variance, you think, in this case? The peaks. Uh, OK, so right, maybe I'm, a, I missed something. So yeah. assume that you are uniformly sampling from this curve, right? So, right. so there are like 100 points that are uniformly distributed on this curve. Okay, so does it make sense if I say that the variance will be maximum along this direction? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I okay. meant, actually. Now, we can't stop there because there is some lateral or vertical movement also perpendicular to this plane. So that will be the second principal component. Now, in this case, the third one is useless. I think we were talking about this. What happens to, in this case, the third one is useless because your data lives in a two-dimensional space, and your two principal components capture all, all the variation, yeah. right? The whole information here. Okay, this is what we hope will happen in higher dimensions also. So, if you now think about what PCA is doing, it's reorienting your coordinate axis 
it's rotating, reflecting, and doing all that, and such that it comes to lie along these three directions. Okay, so if you to do the whole process, C will be a three by three matrix. You will get three eigenvectors. So this will be W one, this will be W two, this will be W three, and if you the actual dimensionality reduction here is very small, but nevertheless, this is how it will look like, right? So finally, if you if you take only PC1 and PC2 and plot it, this is what you will get, right? So this is what you want. You want to reduce the dimensions and compress the data set and throw away all that is unnecessary. Okay, as a simplified perspective, but this is what happens. Okay, so. Final data. Sir, your dimension is reduced by one, right? So. Yeah, just one. So it's it's a toy data set, but still, you reduce it by one. In general, what's going to happen is it'll be reduced by several, maybe by an order of magnitude in some cases. Uh, this looks very similar to basis. This is a basis, right? You are right. So the, you are you are moving to a different basis. Okay, you are moving to a basis. In fact, you, you can say that you're reorienting your standard basis in such a way that you capture maximum information along the first few basis components. Okay, okay you're, that's what you're doing. Geometrically, you are, you are rotating and you're you know, grappling with your basis and trying to orient it along the directions of maximum information. OK, so sir, uh, the final data which we get after applying PCA, will it be like k-dimensional instead of d-dimensional, where k, uh, k is uh, uh, Yeah, you are right. It depends on, so yeah, if, if you are using it in some post-processing, I mean, sorry, some downstream task, as Prof says, let's say you want to classify your data, and you are doing PCA as a pre-processing step, then you will just need those k values for each data point. Thank you, sir. I think, uh, yeah, any questions? If not, we'll stop and maybe meet yeah. one more. Um, can I just go? I just had a little question, little question that um, uh, if you are asked to find the reconstruction error and if you are uh, asked to find the residue, are they the, sa uh, are they the same thing or do we need to, uh, or are they different? The reconstruction error and the residue. So the residue typically is a vector, right? The residue is what? Uh, your point minus projection. So yeah. I think if you're right, if I'm not wrong, the convention is that the residue is a vector, the projection is also a vector, and the reconstruction error is the squared length of the residue. So the residue is a vector, and the kind of the length of that vector is the Reconstruction, I mean, not the length of the vector, but the distance between the reconstructed so you, point. You, uh, correct, you're correct, Rish, uh, Yash. The length of that vector is the, you're right, the first time. So just a small change, length of the vector, and you have to square, right? So the squared length. OK, so, and one more thing, last thing, that if we, uh, if you are asked to find, let's say, uh, this, this basically, this was in the graded assignment, that if you are uh, if you are given two vectors and i mean if you are given a point and we need to find the projection of that point onto a certain vector so do we directly do that or do we first uh, the the vector on which we do we need to project it do we need to change that into uh, a unit length vector and then we should proceed or we can just do it normally you can do it normally itself you can do it process. normally except that in the yeah yeah go ahead go ahead no, no. Uh, what I meant to say is that's something which we were doing in the earlier courses. Remember? Yeah, Math, yeah. Maths and stats. Uh, sorry, not stats. Maths and MLF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, in between, one person just said that we need to convert it, convert it into the unit vector. So I was just a bit confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right. Or you divide by the uh, the norm of that vector. It's the same thing. The yeah. reason attributed then at that point of time is um, unit vectors are easier to work with. That's all. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I got. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That's uh, I have a question uh, regarding the next session. Uh, the calendar is still reflecting that it is the session is from two to four. Or? So the see on. Let's try to meet on Monday. I'll send out an announcement. 
yeah. Wednesday, see that two to four is the I'm fine with six to eight or eight to ten on Wednesday. But apparently it's clashing clashing with the MLF session on that day. And in fact, every other day it's clashing with some other course. So I need to figure out, we need to ask this audience who attend the sessions, right? So we want to yeah, yeah. wrote a form and need to ask which slot uh, has minimum collisions with MLT. So we have to do that. So when we going to take the uh, uh, the programming session, sir? I mean, I didn't get the name. Programming session, we have not yet decided. But so I think once in two weeks at the very least. So we can take ask tomorrow. Us, sir. Uh, we can take tomorrow as well, sir. Like uh, Sunday, I think everyone will be available. Karthik, while while the conversation is going on, can you go to that slide which I was talking about earlier? Uh, the leader combination. I just want to look at it once again. You can continue conversing. I just want to look yeah, at yeah. that. Slide. Yeah, PE. No, no, no the one before. The one before this. Before, before. before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sir, so I have one question regarding the PCA. Like, uh, uh, I'm not getting how many rounds we have to go to finally minimize the number of PCAs. Can you uh, explain that? So, the number of rounds is decided by a heuristic, right? So, as Prof mentioned in the slides, right? So, in the lectures, you typically want to capture some percentage of the information or the variance. And mm -hmm. uh, it's like set at 95% for our course. So. As soon as you capture 95% of the information, then you stop. Whichever round that is, you stop there. And how can we get that, like we have uh, reached our 95%? The heuristics is the heuristics is there, right, in the slide. So, so you have sigma, lambda, i. So lambda 1 is the variance along the first direction, lambda 2 second direction. So you keep adding it, and uh, you end up with the total variance in some sense. And you are you are looking for what at what stage should I stop so that you get this? So you 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 should have seen this formula, right? Sigma lambda i by sigma lambda j, where i goes from one to k, k rounds. In the denominator it goes from one to d, all d rounds. So the numerator keeps changing; it will keep increasing as each round goes by, and at some point it will reach 0.95. At that time, you should stop. But sir, also the sigma lambda d as in the denominator part, uh, like uh, it is not clear what it will be, right? Like uh, lambda i, we are going, we are going to calculate while doing the PCAs, but uh, lambda d part, I'm not getting. How can I get that for a yeah. particular? So there are d lambdas, right? For a for any matrix of okay for the covariance matrix of uh, size d by d cross d. You will have d lambdas, lambda one to lambda d. You will already you will get it from any solver that you have. It will it will return d lambdas to you. So that I okay. Another another d lambda values. Not another d like like uh, not a uh, not the calculated like uh, we have to calculate this separately. Uh, a a minus lambda i like things. Ah, uh, yeah. The point is, yeah, that is true. But you won't have to do it in this course. So in this course, we'll you won't have to do the characteristic polynomial all that a minus lambda i times the determinant of that. All that you you don't need to do in this course. But assume that somebody already does it for you and gives it to you. Okay, so that luxury you have. Karthik here in this slide, here yeah. the the x t w one is the projection of uh, the x onto the principal component, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the principal component as a linear combination of features, that formula we don't have anywhere. I know it's the eigenvector, but uh, is there a way of expressing? Is there a way of? Is there a closed form formula to understand how the features? Add up to the principal component. Oh, the feature. This is the this is the one, right? Because see here, uh, we should treat the x as a 
x1 to xt as variables not correct i understood and this yeah. but xt into w is not the principal component w1 is the principal component yeah yeah so this is not the principal component this is the coordinate of a point yeah yeah this is the projected data yeah yeah this is the whatever the uh, the new data set uh, what right. is transform data or whatever yeah, you yeah. call it right but if i have to express the principal if i have to express w1 in terms of x which are the variables oh okay you want w1 so yeah because we have a closed formula for that if you have it will be very helpful because that the weights there of the features will give can be used to for feature selection that's how it's done so whichever at whichever data points have higher weights right they are the more important one to influence the primary uh, okay. component so that is used for feature selection got it got it okay okay uh, i don't know i so that would require us to understand how the eigen value problem is all right because it's w1 eigen, is... it's a it's an eigen vector we never like eigen vector we solve it separately and you know it's never in terms of the features right so i don't know because most softwares give what is called as principal component loadings okay that will okay. that will tell us in on each principal component which of the features are loading the most mm, okay okay and from there you can identify which the other person was asking i forget his name a while back uh, that's how you can use that to identify which are the features which are more important right like got it got it. yeah yeah I, I don't know then I'll, I'll, I'll try and look for it i'll try and look for it if i find it i'll send it because software is sure. like saas and all give that automatically i'm sure that okay. they're solving it i just have to can look at the literature so i'll do that okay sure i have a question here in this uh, um we're saying this is a linear combination yeah the uh, w1 the principal component Right. So this uh, this would give us a scalar value, right? Yes, this will be a scalar value, and this is the scalar projection, right? In some sense. Yeah, this is the scalar part of the projection. Yeah, yeah. So what what it's I'm saying? Single is value. It's a single value. So if you have to think about this as a new feature that you have extracted out of your D features, then it will be just a single value, right? That's what we are talking. so you how do you so you are looking at the principal component this way how can i combine my d feature values so that i can get a new feature value that is what we have represented it so that is basically the compression part of it we are compressing uh, d features into okay. a single value uh, not really so that is not the compression part of it the compression comes from uh, doing this so okay so the compression comes from choosing a finite a small number of principal components okay so assume so there are how many principal components there are as many principal components as there are dimensions in a data set okay so each principal component will be a linear combination of all d features okay so you have d principal components so the compression comes from choosing let's say only first five or first 10 or what okay that is where the compression kicks in okay Okay, so you're limiting how many principal components to choose, and that is why you you achieve compression. Uh, could you go to that slide where you solve for lambda one and w one? Lambda one w. I think it's ahead. Uh, when we got the solution, minus point seven nine and something like that. Uh, one. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah back so here from what i uh, understood uh, the product of lambda 1 and w1 is c right product of lambda, lambda 1 and w1 should be c or not because the the eigen value into the eigen vector should give you c no it's a w1 uh it's no right so see first of all dimensions won't match right lambda 1 is a scalar w1 is a vector but, but c is a matrix right uh yeah but that when you are talking about that symmetric uh, matrix is when i mean what you had started with the eigen vectors was you have a symmetric matrix and then there will be an eigen vector uh which will give you some <laughs> there were some eigen vectors for that particular so isn't c that same 
symmetric matrix? Yes, no. the C is the same. It's the same covariance matrix, which is also symmetric. But uh, mm. and so if you okay, so if you plug in C into a solver, so that solver will give you the eigenvector of C. Yes, which is W one. Which is W one, right? So what you can say is C W one is lambda one times W one. Sorry, could you repeat that again? So C times W one because W one is an eigenvector. If you transform it using C, you will get lambda one into W one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Now I understood. So it's C into W one is equal to lambda one into W one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I got um, it wrong. I have one question here. Uh, just looking through this, I was meaning to ask you a little earlier. When we calculate the lambda, are we going to take the matrix x x transpose and then say one minus lambda two and two four minus lambda as uh, the matrix and then solve for lambda, or uh, can you repeat that first part? So the uh, what is written on the left side of the slide? X x transpose is one two two four, correct? Right, right. Yeah. So one minus lambda two two. Four minus lambda is what we write and find out lambdas. Is that the way we do it, or is something? Ah, uh, okay. So this is one data point, and x x transpose is the value of the matrix, right? So what what is C? C is sigma x x transpose, right? Sigma x a x a transpose. Correct. So you'll have to do this x x transpose for all the hundred data points that are there. So you'll get hundred okay, such okay. matrices. <clears throat> okay. 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 You add them up. Divide by hundred, you get C, and then you do what you mentioned for C. So you do one min, you do one point seven zero minus lambda. One point seven minus lambda. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. Sorry, sorry. I was yeah. wondering where to apply that. So But, not wondering. Yeah. I was a little lost actually. Thank you. Okay. I don't understand this. The minus. Sorry, I'm the minus lambda part. Okay. Have you done MLS? Uh, you, I'm doing simultaneously. Ah, okay, then don't worry. No, it's like uh, it will come in week four. Now, for now, it's enough if you understand that if you plug in a covariance matrix into some black box, you will get lambda one and W one. Okay. In, so in you, MLF, I'll learn how to plug this in. Plug it. Yes. In. So I'll we'll, know what is the black box. Exactly. Yeah. You will. You'll know how to compute this yourself, but. You so, can wait until week four. Can I just ask a question? I mean, after this particular session, I must say I am understanding a lot of uh, week one. Uh, in fact, I was not able to watch the video on PCA one and PCA two for the simple reason that um, I could not understand some of these derivations. And once I get stuck on a particular point, I just can't move forward. Uh, I just my brain does not does not. <laughs> uh, process yeah. it any further. So now, uh, now that I've learned this, I think I can go through those videos much easier. But I'm just starting to wonder: Did I make a correct choice by taking MLF and MLT together? Uh, yeah. So I think a lot of them are also going through this. Mm, see, first four weeks of first two weeks of MLT will be hard. Even if you have taken MLF prior to this, I think. First two weeks of MLT are going to be really hard. They are the hardest weeks in the course, maybe with the exception of week ten, which is equally hard. Uh, okay. But yeah, so I think you can just just hold on till then and <laughs> so just survive till week three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the plan. Yeah. Okay, Sarvesh, you want to ask something? Uh, uh, hi, yes, sir. So in yeah. lecture one point seven, sir was referring to this Hilbert's min-max theorem, and he was assuming that this was covered in previous linear algebra course. But uh, I don't recall okay. that being the case. So could you please explain what that about? Okay. Yeah. So in fact, see, I would small correction. He didn't assume that it was done. He he just used it as. Uh, One of the tools again as a black box without proving it, right? So you actually don't need to know it in detail. But if you, I think this we did last time, right? So look at this. Uh, we did the min max last time. So what does the min max say? It says that if you have a yeah, so are you able to see this? Yeah, if you are, if you have a symmetric matrix, then Is this the Hilbert's min-max theorem? 
it's the same thing yeah so it's it's okay. telling you that x transpose cx takes the maximum value when you hit lambda one which is the largest eigen value it keeps the minimum value uh, when you take uh, the smallest eigen value sorry smallest uh, what am i saying when x is the eigen vector corresponding to the largest eigen value it hits the maximum which is lambda one and you are using this fact if you want the proof it's here so you can maybe go back and okay okay uh, no this i understand so when I searched through Wikipedia, it was referring to some Hilbert spaces and also I got confused. Like what's that oh, about? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so okay, this one's this clear. Is... Yeah. Okay. Could Thank you, you sir. Repeat this. Uh, when what takes the maximum value? When eigenvalue is max? I didn't tend to get it. Could you repeat that just once? So this is the same thing that we are we we have been doing, right? W transpose C W. We want to find that's our maximization problem, right? We want to maximize. Yes. W transpose CW, and we were saying without proof that that happens when W is W1 or, or the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. Yes. yes. So, what this slide is telling you is there is it's giving you the reason why that is true. Hmm. So, that's the min max theorem, and you don't need to know the details. It's enough to know that this function is maximized when x equal to W1. Okay. Okay, W1 being the eigenvector, and that's enough. Okay. At this stage, that's enough. If you want the proof, it's like this is more of extra extra material. Okay, <laughs> and I have a doubt. I'll understand this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then anything else? If not, we will. Yeah. So, Ka Karthik, uh, yeah. uh, if we can, if you can help me with that, uh, you know, how is that? Uh, is there a closed form formula to understand how the linear combination happens for the PCA? Huh? Okay, so sure. I, I will know to search. But I figured out the question. I think Yash or somebody asked, how do we use this feature for feature selection? I figured out the answer. Okay. Apparently, what all these commercial software, SAS and SPSS and all of them do uh, is once you get the factors, let's say you, you start with 100 features and 100 attributes or 100 features and you end up with 10 principal components or 10 factors, whatever you call them differently. Then you run the correlation of each of the feature with the principal component. And let's say you take the first principal component, which typically has the highest eigenvalue and explains the maximum variance. So that is the most important principal component. You look at all the variables and look at the uh, features and look at the correlation with this. And whichever has high correlation, it means that those are the features which are creating this principal component. Hence, you can use that to shortlist most important features. Apparently, uh -huh. that's how the commercial, so that loadings are apparently correlation. That's what the commercial software do. Oh, nice. Okay, this is interesting. I didn't that's know. What I okay, okay. I'll uh, can you uh, do I have your email ID or something? Can I'll send you some of those papers if you can just share your email ID. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will. Ping you like I there is this messaging feature, right? I'll ping you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. I'll send you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's one person who had asked a question about the reconstruction error in the residuals. Uh, are they do they give one and the same value? Uh, no, right. The residue is the is a vector. So residue is a vector mm -hmm. by convention. So the length of the residue, the square of the length of the residue, is the reconstruction error for one okay. point. Okay. So for the reconstruction error for a data set would be the average squared length of the residue. Okay, got it. That would be a scalar quantity. That will be a scalar, yeah. Okay. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up the session. Thank you so much. It was a really informative session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And for Monday, you'll be sending the invitation, correct? Monday, yes. So I will mail, I'll add a mail. Sorry, I'll send the mail, announcement mail. Typically, uh, something like 6 to 10, right? Somewhere around something in that ballpark. Six, 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 will, yeah. Would it be possible to update the calendar? Yeah, we'll add it in the calendar also, and we'll also yeah. send out a mail. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thanks a lot, Karthik. Yeah. Really nice. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thanks, man.